All right. Well, the first thing I wanted to go over on this whole situation of Lily Orchard uh, talking about the TV universe again was uh, the primary reason I believe is because Hiding in Public, who I've followed for a while, uh, came out with basically a, a moratorium on <laughs> on the old two-hour Why Steven Universe is Garbage video. I don't know why I did that voice. Lily talks more like Ben Shabibo in that sort of, like, uh, I'm talking in a rapid, staccato way that makes me sound reasonable and you sound crazy. I am the smart one. You know, just sort of gish galloping things in, like, a really, really fast-paced way. and just, like, yeah. <laughs> kind of like that. That should be my impression. Just do Ben Shapiro. <laughs> anyway. So, Hip, uh, Hip made... Uh, some videos criticizing Lily, which apparently, uh, struck a nerve, I think. Uh, <laughs> clearly. Um, so, and this is, this is the only part of the hip video you really need to know. Because it's so funny. Imagine writing out and animating a scene this sinister looking. Imagine writing a scene this sinister looking. Too, too bright. <laughs> bright blue and green characters one with a very mixed expression and one who looks kind of upset <laughs> imagine you're writing a scene this sinister looking it's just two cartoon characters with one on the other's shoulder imagine you're writing a scene this sinister looking there's like a sunny sky in the background with some clouds <laughs> Imagine you're writing a show this sinister looking. They're like lime green and blueberry colored. <laughs> Imagine writing as an animated So scene. yeah. So that instantly became like that instantly became like a meme in the Steven Universe fandom, at least in the circles I'm in. Just every once in a while someone comes out with Imagine writing a scene this sinister looking <laughs> So good. Oh my god, Steven committed cannibalism against his children, his filicide. I mean, I'm I'm always saying, you know, Steven is exactly as bad as the diamonds, because he's always making, like, these intelligent plant people and just neglecting them. I mean, ugh, honestly. So anyway. I guess there's a second person on Lily Orchard's channel now? I, I don't know. Wait, that's some ugly-ass fucking art right there, though. So this is a new one. Um, I don't know why Roxas was there. Uh, or is that the other one? Um, oh, okay. Put wifey on the channel. Alright. I guess that makes sense. Um, let's see. I guess some, some, of, you, some of you know the Lily Orchard lore better than I do! <laughs> I, I really don't follow this person. I just know about the original... But, like, Lily's been coping and seething about fucking Steven Universe forever. Still using it in thumbnails. Because I guess somebody needs money, huh? Um. Oh, that's the wife's art? Oh, okay. Oh, I feel a little bad now. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel this person has nothing to- the wife has nothing to do with it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should maybe be more careful here. Uh. I mean, it was Lily's art. It's like the fucking fair game. <laughs> Um, I noticed another one earlier. Yeah, again, keeps putting CV Universe characters in thumbnails. You know, oh, I'm totally over CV Universe, you guys. I'm totally over it. And then I noticed they did one about the movie, too. And it's like, maybe we're gonna have to watch that one, too. Because I think this, this one's an hour and this one's a half an hour. Depends on how long I pause things. We'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, I'm just becoming a React channel now, apparently. And then, I guess, um... I, I've never seen Owl House. I haven't watched the Harley Quinn show. I'm not from. I haven't watched Shira. I'm not familiar with any of this shit. I haven't even watched Spy X Family. <laughs> or do you call it? Do you call it Spy X Family or do you call it Spy Family? I'm I'm not entirely clear on that. I think I would like it. I just haven't gotten around to, to watching it. Watching it. Oh, let's talk about internet s stalking. You know a thing or two about that from what I've heard. They're uh, they're. I was gonna try to come up with other flower names, but I blanked. Um, I haven't watched the Venture Brothers movie yet, Kaiser. I've seen the damn show. <laughs> I love Venture Brothers. I just—it takes me a little while to like sit down and actually pay attention to something. Okay, leave me, leave me alone. Anyway, enough procrastinating. Let, let's see what this is fucking about. No, I haven't watched. She I wasn't very interested in Shira, to be honest. I, I just didn't care. <laughs> 
I was never into the original very much either, so it is, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Rose, Rose, uh, that's another word for an orchid. Rose Field. Fields of Gold. I don't know. Fields of Gold over here. That's your name now. <laughs> Trash talking on Steven not helping Spinel and trying to help his fellow gems. You know, oh yeah, not, not, well, he did help her in the end, but like, you know, she was trying to kill the entire planet. That's, that's, um, oh shit, Kaiser, I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I completely forgot. <laughs> that's right. You linked me an episode of something and I was like, oh yeah, I'll watch that later. And then I didn't. <laughs> Five years ago, I made a big video on Steven Universe. Five years ago? Really? Jesus Christ. What is time? What is time? Anyway, uh, oh, let me turn this up. I usually have my YouTube videos kind of low. Uh, so if it's too loud, guys, please tell me. I am so bad at balancing audio, you know this. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't know a damn thing about the she cartoon, so <laughs> I, and I don't care, really. I mean, a lot of Netflix cartoons are kind of bad. <laughs> it seems like it went a little too young. Well, like I said, Jaden, it's like it's like the same cadence as Ben Shapiro. So of course, it's like you instantly. It's just like the most punchable kind of kind of way of speaking. If if ways of speaking can be punchable, um. Oh no, the hard the hard R. <laughs> God, I blame Deadwing Dork for getting me to call to call retard the hard R. God damn it. It's a joke. It's a joke for, for reference, guys. <laughs> but anyway, okay, let's enough procrastinating. Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna ink while the while this this idiot talks. And haven't stopped having a migraine since. The thing is, like everything ever made, it hasn't fault. aged well. Ask any artist if they like looking at their old work. Time, context, the fact that Steven Universe is over now, and five years of growth as a person and critic as reflected poorly on that old video. I have admit Hey guys. Does anyone really think that Lily Orchard has had five years of growth as a person? Because <laughs> I'm pressing X to doubt over here. <laughs> Again, I don't know the lore of this person as well as some other, but I've heard things. I've heard things that are that are mm, not good. Many instances tried to update it to more modern standards with better critique, which none of you terminally outraged motherfuckers bothered to watch. So when I see people still <laughs> passing it around trying to refute. Why aren't you outraged at my videos, Steven Universe fans? I totally triggered you with the first one. <laughs> but you didn't, because most of your points were, like, either, like, provably incorrect, or were just, like, the most bad faith interpretation you could possibly muster of a scene possible, or was just you being unable to follow the themes and plot lines in a children's show. It's no fault but yours. <laughs> I feel like I'm locked in a time loop where a video I made while I was dealing with severe abuse and was therefore constantly angry is being held up as if it reflects- Oh, so, give me a break, dude! I was being abused when I made that video, so that's why I was, like, shrieking that Rebecca Sugar is a piece of shit who needs to die. Okay, I don't know if Rebecca Sugar needs to die was said, but it was like, con like, every five minutes it was like, Rebecca Sugar, you piece of shit! Oh my god! And it was like- uh, like, I'll at least give the benefit of the doubt that it was an attempt at, like, the 2012 kind of angry reviewer type thing, but it sounded like genuine rage and hatred to me. I, I, uh... <laughs> Flex everything about me today. And the truth is, my opinion on Steven Universe has changed quite a bit. In truth, I was honestly taking out my anger at many other things in my own personal life onto something that flat out cannot be hurt. In recent- You don't say- You don't say! You don't say! <laughs> years, I've taken a much kinder view of Steven Universe, almost entirely because it's interesting to talk about. Let me make this clear, I do not think the show is- Is it interesting to talk about, or is it- does it get you YouTube bucks when you talk about it, because it's like the only thing you're known for? <laughs> yeah, I heard about the sister. I think some people told me about the sister, which I didn't even know there was a sister, but I mean, I've heard- I've heard about, you know, questionable My Little Pony fan fiction and just- general shitty behavior, you know, I've heard that stuff. Good. My feelings you, on it today yeah, can be summed did. up as- Okay, l l listen, Jaden, I'm gonna- I gotta be real with you, I have a terrible memory, so don't- I'll take it personally if I completely forgot who told me something. I do that to people in real life all the time, I'm like, 
didn't you tell me this? And they're like, no. And I'm like, oh, it must have been so-and-so. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm just... I'm just... Yeah, 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 Meteor. I mean, I don't know enough uh, myself. I, and I haven't, like, like researched this person. It's just not a low cow I'm interested in. Is Lily Orchid a low cow? Uh, I guess... Meh. Half and half? Maybe skim low cow? <laughs> we go with that? Oh, yes! I hate this! It is revolting! More? Please. Steven Universe is a lot of things, but boring isn't one of them. And years no, afterwards, sure. I was dealing with trying to wring analytical content out of shows that all go bad in the same boring, predictable ways to the point I just got so tired of it. That's why I don't like adventure fantasy as a concept. They're all the same, and you try coming up with a new script every two weeks. Okay, if you don't like adventure fantasy, stop watching it. As simple. I don't watch- I like- I don't care about sports movies. So guess what? I don't fucking watch them and make reviews on them. <laughs> ...to describe Adventure Time times 12. But Steven Universe fails in very fascinating ways if you want to dig into it. It's practically become a critical muse. Let me make this clear, I- Okay, listen- listen to me right now. Every time- and I know I'm pausing a lot. This is probably going to take two hours to get through. Every time someone talks about CB Universe criticism, they say, The fans can't take any criticism at all. I have, like, entire Twitter threads on all of my bugbears with the show. And I have my own... Yeah, it is my own EFAP. I'm, I'm definitely EFAPing right now. I'm being very self-indulgent. <laughs> but, um... Like, I have my own criticisms about the show and its writing. I have, like, especially season five. I have a lot of very, very strong opinions that sometimes people get angry at me over. But it's like, the way I enjoy media is I also look at it on the technical level and the way it's constructed. Because I have a writer and artist brain, I guess. Now, I know about EFAP. I'm just, I'm just making the pun. <laughs> making the pun. It's called every frame a... a Every frame of picture or every frame of painting or something, right? But then it sounds like it sounds like you're fapping, right? So because you're being self indulgent. That was the that was the joke, Kaiser. Maybe it didn't land. Yeah, I, I heard about how awful the ending of Star Versus was, so I just completely skipped that one. <laughs> so I remember the, the, the original two hour video going around at the time Sunshini before I got into Steven Universe. Oh, every frame a pause. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna watch that one. I might watch the Lily Arkers one on the movie, though. Just to see how brain-dead the takes are. Uh, I would love nothing more than to sit down with someone who really likes this show and thinks it's brilliant and pick their brain. Because I am- f I- I am available. I am- I am quite available. Um, I could, you know- <laughs> fascinated by that notion. The problem is, nobody does it. Most of the rebuttals to that old video are less about arguing why Steven Universe is good, and more about being outraged at the sheer audacity of suggesting otherwise. There have been a- No, motherfucker! It's because everything you say is wrong in that video. You can't even follow the plot. <laughs> you can't even follow the plot in a children's cartoon. That is a failure on your account. <laughs> Half a dozen videos Sorry. trying to I had debunk a, the old- I had, I, had, I had to go a little super saiyan there and put my lips right against the microphone. I'll, I'll try to refrain. <laughs> video, and honestly, I haven't watched a single one of them. I would definitely watch a Steven Universe's Genius and Here's Why, because I find that position fascinating, but- That's exactly the video that Hiding in Public made that made you make this video. Well, actually, no. Hiding in Public first made a video- Picking apart Lily's video, and then he made a video about why Steven Universe is good. You could have gone and watched that, Lily, if you're absolutely so fascinated in why people think it's good. I mean, I'm used to having odd opinions on media. I like the ending of Attack on Titan, and you can fight me on it. Oh, no, Aachen, I love, I love those fucking memes. I love those fucking memes. Ian, Ian, actually, Ian, James, um, uh, James, yeah, James, Ian Jones, Cordy, <laughs> tweeted out recently that he thinks the Stephen crying memes are funny. And I think the, the future version is even funnier, because it's the shot of Stephen crying in his car when he's saying goodbye to the gems. <laughs> but it's, in that context, it looks like Stephen's just doing, like, drive-by redemptions of people. <laughs> like, just driving up to them, stopping while crying, saying, you don't have to do this! 
and it cracks me up. Let's go through this five-year-old video and debunk it is exactly the kind of comp- One of her fans made fan art of her and she told them to off themselves. What? Why? <laughs> was it like troll fan art? Like, was it mean? <laughs> Bat of mudslinging? That's just fucking boring. It's not 2018 anymore. I don't want to fight you in the Denny's parking lot over Utena fanfiction. You! Shut up! Utena fanfiction? First of all, it's Utena, or Utena, not Utena, idiot. <laughs> Second of all, it's nothing- no, I've heard- I've heard the ending of the- the fucking she show is Utena fanfiction that doesn't understand the ending of Utena. But, um, I'll say it the wee boy even. Shoujo Kakume Utena. I am an old taku. Dude! Keep talking. Part of critical analysis is having to compare where something missteps to when it doesn't. That's where criticism becomes fun. Nothing is truly 100% bad, except conservative politics, and that contrast between its successes and failures is where criticism really shines. But nobody's talking about where Steven Universe Yeah, that's so where it really shines. Yeah, yeah, now you're an advocate for this show? I am pressing X to doubt again. Seeds. So, I guess I'll have to do it myself. Oh, Lily's actually gonna try to praise the show. Did you pull a muscle? <laughs> Did you pull a muscle doing this? Did you cough up blood? <laughs> Steven Universe is interesting to talk about precisely because it's writing bounds between being great and great piles of shit. There's a reason everybody says it could have been great, because after multiple episodes where characters do nothing, don't advance- It's not that it could have been great, it is great, but it does have some major flaws here and there, and some- some real lack of prioritization in the writing is what I always say is Steven Universe's biggest problem. They kind of waffle around a bit. I mean, I know I hate- I know- I hate- no, I don't hate it, but I know people hate when people call the, the towny episodes filler. It's not technically, but it just seems like they didn't put as much effort into those, you know, and they just kind of didn't really know what they wanted to do with the show at first. It's very, very obvious. I'm a, I'm a pretty big critic of season 1A, and I have decided- I've elected to ignore it uh, for the sake of my own sanity when it comes to uh, lore for the series. <laughs> so the plot and don't advance their own character and you're about ready to write the show off completely, they throw something like Bubbled at you. Bubbled is one of the best episodes of the entire show. The premise is that Steven was ejected into space last episode and he's protecting himself from the vacuum with his defensive bubble and it's just him and one of the ruby soldiers and all they can do is talk and so that's exactly what they do. It's a quiet uh -huh. episode with a lot of really discordant music that does a lot to sell just how big and empty space is. How even if you managed to survive, you'd be adrift. You'd be completely and utterly alone forever. And Steven's trapped with someone who wants him dead and doesn't know it yet. Not only is this the first time Steven hasn't been able to talk someone down, he's also on- What do you mean he doesn't know it yet? <laughs> they fought- This is how they ended up in space in the first place. They just fought the rubies, right? I I'm pretty sure. Didn't they all get ejected off the moon base? Wasn't that what happened? So, I'm pretty sure he knows Eyeball wants him dead. <laughs> Again, cannot follow the plot of a children's show. ...on his own, and rescue isn't coming anytime soon. After things come to a head and Steven has to ditch Eyeball, there's nothing left to do but just float there in the empty void of space, completely and utterly alone. It only lasts about 30 seconds before he's rescued by the others, but it's 30 seconds uh -huh. of the best visual storytelling Steven Universe has ever done. I honestly think it would have been a lot better without Eyeball. To have Steven do his usual, I'm not paying attention to the danger I'm in shtick, and have it slowly reach the crescendo of that last moment, as the reality that he is alone, adrift, and can't get back fully settles in on him. Really deconstructs Steven's tendency to goof off in tense situations. There really is no better way to have a character reflect on their decisions and- His tendency to goof off in tense situations. He is a 13-year-old boy. <laughs> I'm just gonna put that out there. Also, kids show. And ...their choices in life than to just set them adrift in space. But for what it is, Bubbled is a- Oh, hang on. The thing with Lily is that she loves fluffy coffee shop AUs more than anything. Well, <laughs> those don't really make for good, like, actual shows. I mean, imagine if you had a show that was just a coffee shop AU. 
set up, but without any of the emotional attachment to the characters you would have pre-built in in a fanfic, it would not work. <laughs> <laughs> good exploration of the concept, and one of the few times where everyone from the animators to the writers, well, they're the same thing, to the musicians bringing their A-game. Then the next episode is an extent- The animators and the writers aren't the same thing, the storyboarders and the writers are the same thing, the animators are in Korea. Ugh, <laughs> oh, that's like such a simple thing to not get wrong. ...to Roadrunner homage. Then the next episode is a game show montage where Steven and Amethyst are shown to suffer from self-worth issues through the vector of a game show. Then the next episode is a lore dump. Then the next episode is bad. This pattern of really good episodes then leading- Did you just- did you- <laughs> Did you just call the episode with Here Comes a Thought bad? <laughs> uh, the whole episode where Steven is struggling with his guilt? While he and, 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 and Connie are trying to fuse a Stavati and, like, like, <laughs> don't even, don't even explain why it's bad, I guess, just, uh, yeah, okay, sure, with, the one with, like, one of the most famous, impactful songs in it. Okay, well, can you, can, can you give me the TL? The TLDR on why Lily thinks that episode is bad because I didn't, I don't even fucking remember <laughs> what that point was. Being into an anime-inspired lore dump has confirmed what I believed for a while. The biggest problem with the show's writing is that everyone involved can make really good character drama, it's just that they would rather make anime references. So many of the good moments in this show are just when characters have to stop bounding around in badly animated fight scenes, or weird drug trip sequences, or crying speeches about redemption and friendship, and talk- Okay, f Find me one single crying speech about redemption and friendship in Steven Universe, like, for real. Like, yeah, we make the joke that that's what the show is like, but, like, give me one instance of somebody, like, sobbing while talking about friendship in Steven Universe. That's something you'd see in fucking Demon Slayer, you know, or, so or something like that, you know? Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Tanjiro is definitely a bigger bleeding heart crybaby than Steven Universe is. I, I I will say that. Yeah, right? Like, Connie is also having, like, a hard time. And they both have to reconcile it. And, and Garnet is teaching them mindfulness. It's it, it's animated by Takaf Takafumi Hori! But, of course, Lily thinks Takafumi Hori was brought in as, like... Like, a way to, like, boost numbers or boost the animation or something? No. Takafumi Hori is just a fan of Steven Universe. He has gone on- he has gone on record saying that Steven Universe is his favorite show. This legendary Japanese animator worked on Steven Universe because he loves Steven Universe. <laughs> but wait. She thinks it focuses too much about Connie's- Tr trauma, saying it isn't trauma. Connie feeling bad that she broke a kid's arm is, like, not valid somehow. <laughs> I just... Why? Also, Akendok, um, I talked about Wish, uh, the last two streams, so, uh, I do have a- I do have a clip of my general thoughts up, uh, on- on my, uh, on my channel. Uh, the VOD from last week's stream has probably expired. I think I downloaded it or recorded it. I, I did give, like, my summary of the movie and what happens in it and why it's not a functional narrative at all. So if you're interested in that, I do have a clip of me talking about it. Maybe we can talk about it again after this. But we'll see. <laughs> Talk like normal people. But these moments are few and far between, especially when you have an edict from on high mandating near constant peanut gallery. It's been complained about before, but Steven has this rather unusual trait where Steven has to actually be present for an event in order for it to happen. So if you thought you could have a moment- Well, no, it's just that we don't see something happening unless Steven is there to witness it because of the Steven-only perspective, which I do have my own criticisms of. I think they didn't commit to it enough, for one thing, they, it, it, and they, they write themselves into corridors a few times because of the Stephen Only perspective, and it can be it can be frustrating, but, like, that's just their creative choice, you know, like it or hate it. <laughs> it's kind of a neutral thing, they just fumble it sometimes, in my opinion. Went ...between Garnet and Pearl as they both talk about losing someone important to them, you can't get that because the show has to contrive a way for Stephen to be there. You think, like, 
you think, like, adults never have arguments in front of children? You know, I mean, the, it's normal family shit, man. <laughs> I, just, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and if he's there, E has to be the center of attention. There's an episode where Amethyst is excited for a rock concert. He has to be the center of attention. What about last one out of Beach City where he's just kind of in the back seat for the whole thing? <laughs> when Greg bails on her, Pearl offers to drive instead, and then drags Steven along as well. The episode is interesting Ex because- Well, exactly! No what I'm fucking talking about! Steven's just- he's just- he's not the center of attention! <laughs> Most of it is dedicated to Pearl getting a crush on a woman who looks a lot like Rose, and it's probably the best episode primarily featuring Pearl living her life and moving forward with it. But it's brought down by the fact that Steven has to be there making glib remarks the entire time. As much as I loathe the notion of critiquing an episode by wishing it was a different episode- What glib remarks does he make? He just sits there being a child and saying things. I mean, I mean, he points out the chick looks like Rose. Like, I wouldn't call that glib exactly. He's just kind of like, uh, hey, Pearl, I kind of noticed this. Uh. <laughs> Buddy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, uh, just uh, throwing that out there. <laughs> but entirely, if this were a solo Pearl episode, it'd be great. Pearl goes on a quiet road trip during the night, thinking about everything, resolving to move forward with her life, coming home a renewed... Wait a minute, but, but what, you don't want Amethyst to be there then? She's just supposed to have nobody else to talk to in an episode? That sounds like a terrible way to write an episode of television, unless you're like that kind of show in the first place. Person... Sometimes you just gotta go take a drive in the dark somewhere quiet to think about everything. Hey, the stuff with Amethyst going to her concert is just a framing device to get Pearl in a car and talking to buff Imowen anyway. You could do this the whole episode with no dialogue, just the car radio and some sound effects. Someone driving in a car at night is a surprisingly somber atmosphere. It's a shame a lot of shows don't use it. But because we're not- Wasn't that clip from the Family Guy episode where he accidentally goes down on Lois's mother- I'm just, I'm just interesting choice of example. Uh. <laughs> Not allowed to do anything without including Steven. Instead, the episode has to deal with his commentary the entire time. Okay, nobody's gonna say it. She kind of looked like mom. You noticed. I noticed. We all noticed. Yes, Steven, we noticed. Now please shut the fuck up. Lily, that is for the children in the audience, Lily. The children for whom the show is made, Lily. Sometimes things have to be pointed out for the children, you know, that's just... That's just something you have to accept when you are watching children's programming, Lily. <laughs> I, I don't know, after all these years, you don't understand this. This is a really good, quiet moment where Pearl can just think and you can soak in the visual storytelling they presumably care so much about, but no, Steven has to open his fucking mouth. And the worst part is that this is not something the show has to do. Fans argue, well, he's the main character, but lots of shows have main characters. They still take time to give other people a moment in the spotlight. But if this were a show just about him, that would be fine, but oftentimes the show has episodes- But, 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 this is a Pearl Spotlight episode. It's mostly focused on her. But, you know, typically, when you're writing an episode of television, you want other characters to be there for the person it's focused on to, to interact with, you know? I don't know. It's like, yeah, we should just have a long, quiet episode without any dialogue and just radio music of Pearl just driving around having adult feelings about things. And in this show, that's like... Like, for seven and up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, sure. Buddy, this is what fanfiction is for. Go write that fanfic if that's what you want, alright? <laughs> That's not really a criticism of the show. That's just your personal taste. It's focusing on other people and what they think and feel. And the writers have to awkwardly shove Steven in there for it to happen. And once he's there, everything just proceeds like a normal show. It's like a fucking Kingdom Hearts cutscene where things play out as they did in the source material, but Sora, Donald, and Goofy are just there in the background. This is the biggest- Yeah, but- 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 That's Kingdom Hearts, like, just replicating movies. TV Universe is still its own story. I- Oof, I just don't get that point. This contributor for why the story is often so rushed and slapdash. In a normal show, it will often- <laughs> Yeah, Jaden, of course he's there! It's his show! Yeah, it's almost like his name is in the freaking title or something, huh? <laughs> 
often cut away to the villains so you can actually know what they're doing and thinking, or sometimes side characters will have their time in the spotlight. It's an essential part of storytelling that has pretty much been the standard for films and television since they figured out you could cut film and stick bits of it together and it just works. But here, it just doesn't happen because Steven isn't there to see it happen. Yellow and Blue Diamond have a very sudden switch in the final arc where it turns out that they've been questioning Homeworld's fascist dictatorship for a long time. Would have been nice to have seen that at all, but... I mean, we kind of see that in what's the use of feeling blue. They're both struggling with, you know, their existence. Why do I want an episode with him on holiday? When did I say- What did I say that? What? What? Wait a minute, what? What did I say? <laughs> uh... Is this, is this a reference to my, my idea for the, the next Steven Universe movie where Steven is just, like, out of the picture most of the time on his road trip, like, falling for various tourist traps while everyone else is trying to solve a problem without telling him? <laughs> that would be my ideal next movie. <laughs> like, there's some crisis, the gems are trying not to let Steven know about it so he can, like, fucking just live his life. And he's just calling in, like, at the most inopportune moments, like, Pearl, I found another world's largest ball of twine! And he's, like, wearing a cheese hat from Wisconsin or something. And Connie's, like, in the background staring at the phone, like, pleading for help with her eyes. <laughs> Steven is just falling for every single shitty tourist side attraction. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a very Steven thing to me. But Steven was too busy hanging out with Onion for 20 episodes. So many characters have issues and- 20 episodes? I'm pretty sure Onion is in like five? Two of them are bad? I don't know. I don't, I don't like Onion Friend and Onion Gang. I think those episodes suck personally, especially Onion Gang, but that's, that's just me. Oh, look, look what we're on right now. Imagine writing a scene this sinister looking. <laughs> Trauma that they have to work through, but can't because Steven has to be there or they aren't allowed to. If Steven doesn't bother to check up on them, you never learn about them at all. Getting back to last one out of Beach City, that episode ends with Pearl getting a girl's number and showing some sign of moving on with her life. This is never followed up on, and this girl, who is only known as Mystery Girl by the Phantom, never appears again. This is a recurring- And she doesn't talk in the episode! Isn't that what you wanted? Silent shit in the episode? Also, Pearl doesn't learn how to use a phone till like two years later because she's a boomer. She's- she's literally a gem boomer. She's like 8,000 years old, what do you want from her? <laughs> in problem, and honestly, removing Steven's perspective from the equation wouldn't actually solve it, because the real problem at play is that the crew doesn't care. They let Pearl hook up with a cute buff lady, but they didn't want to revisit it because they just didn't care. They'd rather do six episodes- Because they just didn't care, or because, like, Cartoon Network wouldn't have let them show her dating a woman? You might, you might have forgotten that uh, same-sex marriage wasn't even legalized in the United States federally until 2015. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a lot more pushback. It's almost like Steam Universe kind of opened the door for a lot of more, like, gay content in, 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 in cartoons or something, you know? <laughs> episodes about Sadie's band. So many characters, often main I do agree the episodes about Sadie's band should have just been fucking cut, personally, but... <laughs> <laughs> characters are left critically underdeveloped because the writers are too busy making joke episodes and callbacks to other shows they like. As much as we can blame the For Steven perspective, it's ultimately the showrunner who decides what the show is going to be about. Peridot is one of the few crystal gems to have a really interesting character entirely because a lot of time is spent with her. You get to see this transition from a blue collar technician trying to check on a super weapon to someone who has come to love life and everything in it. And it only happens with a ton of episodes of focus, something most of the other characters just flat out don't get. Peridot is the only character who gets to have scenes where Steven isn't present. Granted, the entire premise of the episode is Steven listening to her tape recorder, but fuck it, I'll take a half-assed approach to telling a story like a normal person. This is the only time you get to see characters interact with each other without Steven's running commentary. Hell, she spends most of it interacting with Garnet, another character who desperately needed some real screen time. God, Jesse Zook did not deserve the shit this show's garbage fandom gave them. This is what happens when you spend time with a character and do more than one thing with them. Peridot becomes such an interesting character because you see so many different avenues of her explored. Homeworld's fascist dictatorship means she has to unlearn fascist propaganda, understand fusion, learn- Well, yeah, she is the vehicle for understanding what Homeworld's attitudes are like because Lapis has been in a mirror for 5,000 years, so she's- she has no idea what modern Homeworld is like. She even says that. She gets home and, like, she can't recognize anything. That's- 
I do feel bad for Lapis in that instance, even though I don't like her very much. Uh, um, and then Jasper is Jasper, also currently trapped in a fusion with Lapis at the moment. So our only window into what Homeworld is like is Peridot, and that is her utility in these episodes. So this is written like a normal functional show. I, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> to love living beyond just being a cog in the machine, it's so good and she becomes visibly happier as a result. And she's the only one who gets this. They had so many ideas for Peridot and they were like, let's do all of them. I would have loved to see that kind of passion, dedication, and care given to the entire main cast. It's actually quite surprising just how little time is spent on the main characters. Go back over most episodes and keep a tally of how many are actually about a main character and how many do anything substantial with them that opens a new avenue for them or moves their arc forward. Most okay, well, you, you that, that that last part's a matter of opinion because you say like nothing moves their their plots forward, or you just completely miss things because I don't know, you're not paying attention, you're picking your nose or something while this is going on. I, I, you, or or maybe it's because you went into the show determined to hate it, so you just ignore it when it does good things. Yeah, yeah, I think I think. Episodes are actually about some rando in Beach City who are usually one note joke characters, and the ones that are actually about the main cast usually just rehash. Man, you really hate Onion, huh? <laughs> Which is something they've already done. Even Steven, <laughs> oh, I remember that show. The character who is legally mandated to always be on screen at all times is criminally underdeveloped. Name five things about Steven that aren't compassion, trauma, fat, savior complex, or Connie. Um, enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm for, like, the mundane things in life. Uh, he does get- he does- he can't get frustrated easily like a kid does, you know? He is really sappy and likes weddings and romance stuff. Uh <laughs> <clears throat> oh, Onion- Onion's great. I mean, he is a shitpost. But Onion's great. Oh yeah, Steven loves music. In fact, he makes his dad tell him, like, stories in musical form. I like how we're just, like, really saying, tell me something about Steven except, like, some of his main traits, you know? Well, <laughs> what's wrong with this? one of his main traits being compassion? I mean, what? Yeah. <laughs> determination! He's filled with determination. And it can be a bit of a dumb himbo sometimes. I still remember when I was watching, uh, uh, oh, Bravery too, yeah, yeah. When I was watching, uh, Future for the first time, and he, he called himself, uh, Stephen Quartz Cutie Pie Diamond DeMeo Universe, I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is still the same dumb dumb boy we've been following. <laughs> What does he like? What keeps him going every day? How does he actually feel about the other gems? What does he want to do when he grows up? So much time. All of these things are answered! <laughs> All of them! <laughs> what? What does he want to do when he grows up? He wants to get married. That's like all the only thing the, the crew could think of either, because <laughs> he's so saccharine. That's great. Hang on, who was- who was- oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody pinged me. It was a joke I made in Hoseki no Kuni uh, server, it's fine. <laughs> Time with Steven spent watching him fix other people's problems like he's the fucking messiah. The most interesting thing they can do with him is have him crack under the stress. So what are you gonna do? Shatter me? Go ahead. Just do it! No! Even if we don't agree, nobody deserves this. Okay, so you're just gonna remove the context of this, huh? But even when that- Yeah, okay, like, two years later, Steven is spiraling, trying to find meaning in his life. He goes to, like, everybody he- char character development! Now he's a murderer! <laughs> but no, Steven- Future is all about Steven going around to everybody he knows, trying what works for them, and failing utterly, and just getting worse and worse mentally. Because, you know, you can't you can't fill your life with what only works with, for other people. So then of course, his last resort is like the worst possible person he could he could go to for advice, which would be Jasper. 
And my theory about why he ended up shattering her is that I think Jasper believes... I mean, I think Steven believes Jasper's hype. Jasper was the first, like, truly dangerous villain Steven encountered. And I think on some level, because he never actually defeated her himself, ever. Even even with... Even in Earthlings, he was Smoky Quartz with Amethyst, and then... Jasper just kind of defeated herself by refusing to be helped when she was being corrupted. So he never actually, like, defeated her. So I think to Steven, he thought Jasper was as indestructible as she acts like she is. So, I, he, there's no way he intended to shatter her. He, he basically thought, you know, like, Oh yeah, I'll show you my full power like you keep telling me to, come on. And then, whoopsie doodles, uh, <laughs> he kind of, uh, he kind of shattered her. It's a little different between Bismuth saying, just shatter me then, and and Steven accidentally shattering Jasper because he just spent three days with her, listening to her might-makes-right rhetoric, and <laughs> is emulating her. <laughs> Unless I forget, Jasper has probably shattered, like, hundreds of gems. I mean, let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> that story ends, he just moves away, and the show ends, waiting to be renewed again so we can all experience the second coming of Steven. So much of the show- Waiting to be renewed again? What the fuck are you talking about? They only got those 20 episodes that became future because Cartoon Network and their infinite wisdom decided that after the movie was greenlit, well, they need to have a show going on still, so after we forced you to end your show early, here's 20 more episodes. <laughs> It's like the biggest crock of bullshit I've ever heard of, and it's exactly why I'm much easier on Future than I am on the main show, because what do you do with that? Network forces you to end your show early, and rush the ending of your story, you get a movie greenlit, and then they go, well, if you're gonna have a movie, you gotta have episodes out, so here's 20 more. Just like that. I would, I, I mean, I, I... Rebecca Sugar must be a better person than me, because I probably would have burned the building down <laughs> if I received that news, personally. Just... <laughs> oh, that's probably... Well, I think the Crystal Gems did try not to shatter other gems. They probably did just buttle... Bubble? Buttle. They buttled them. They bubbled en en enemy gems, maybe? Held them prisoner? But then that would mean that some of those gems and bubbles aren't corrupted. That's a problem. But I mean, they were also willing to keep Peridot bubbled forever, so maybe some of those gems aren't corrupted. <laughs> They're just prisoners. Oh, ugh. <laughs> the crystal gems are a little darker than we thought. <laughs> that was a pantomime that looks like it's doing something with the characters, but how they feel about anything is often left decidedly vague. Steven doesn't really get his own story. His entire story is cleaning up the mess left by his deadbeat mom, and so most of the time spent with him that isn't him dicking deadbeat around mom. is just learning more secrets about his birth mom. That's great for the people who make theory videos and like speculating. There's no shortage of mysteries to solve and content to mill, especially given the fact that most of them are just never gonna be answered, so you'll never be wrong. But it's all mystery and no payoff, because at the end it's just, well, I guess that's a whole lot of stuff we now know. Getting back to- It's almost like Steven discovering things about his mother is supposed to mirror the whole, you know, as you grow up you start to realize that your parents are also flawed human beings, just like anyone else, who just like anyone else don't really know what the fuck they're doing. Because nobody does. You know, as you grow up, you kind of start to realize your parents, like, are human. <laughs> so yeah, Steven starts out as a little kid who's heard all these stories about how great his mom was. Because who was going to tell an eight-year-old, yeah, your mother committed war crimes. And then as he grows up, he has, to, he has to learn that life is more complicated than he thought it was. Yeah, almost like it's a fucking metaphor or something. <laughs> Pearl, I find her story is most emblematic of this unwillingness to take a step forward, because Pearl has a lot of time spent with her, but it's all time spent recycling the same story. That being Pearl's grief over losing the love of her life. Now, the uh -huh. nature of Pearl's is weird, it's- Yeah, it was only 14 years ago, and she's like thousands of years old, give her a fucking break! <laughs> of course she's still gonna be grieving! But we can see that Pearl's in a way better place she was than in the immediate aftermath. Because if you watch uh, Three Gems and a Baby, Pearl is super moody in that episode. She's very moody and standoffish. She doesn't want anything to do with anyone else. And she's just obviously pissed off. 
So, she's obviously come a long way from just then. So, like, you know, maybe you should consider the whole, like, the whole show, like, all the episodes together, instead of just, like, you know, looking at the pieces. You know, it might be, it might be a thing. <laughs> Very clearly chattel slavery, but Becky often denies that, so it's clear this- Chattel slavery? Who denies that? It's pretty clear that the pearls are, like- living series they're just they're just they were made they were made to be accessories and assistance so like who denies that that's like technically slavery but also like i had this argument with some people on twitter a while back no gem gets to choose their role and they're all subject to the same oppression yeah pearls are looked down on as lower ranking than other other gems because they're not actually gemstones even like a pearl isn't a gemstone they just kind of get lumped in with them a lot of the time and they use that real-world context as, like, you know, inspiration for the role of pearls in homeworld society. So, also, like, slavery still exists today, and it's worth showing that it's a bad thing. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> wasn't intended, but that's not a very complicated topic. Becky's not very smart, tried to do one thing, smashed her face into a wall, whatever, I get it. I have a more interesting- Oh, couldn't, couldn't even get through a positivity section without, like, like, just, like- calling Rebecca Sugar in some way stupid or high or a piece of shit, huh? Just, you know, the most milquetoast, low-key, chill woman in the world. And you're angry at this female showrunner for... Uh, existing, I guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ...point to make, so I'm just gonna take Becky at her word that this wasn't what it was supposed to be. I am gonna play this clip again, though. Still, having said that, I feel guilty. Okay, I'm good. Let's go. So the thing about oh, okay. Pearl is that her What's story that never gets to move forward. Is that a joke? Pearl is where Becky wears her Revolutionary Girl Utena jacket the most. And the thing about Revolutionary Girl Utena is- It's just aesthetic, though. It's just visual reference to Utena. Like, the first time I saw Pearl uh, in Steven the Swordfighter, like, demonstrating her sword fighting stuff, I was like, oh, I recognize the Utena uh, animation reference immediately because if you've ever seen Utena- you were gonna see those animations, like, a hundred fucking times, because the show had a budget of about five yen and a piece of string, and so, like, they reused the animation a lot, like, even worse than Sailor Moon, same director, incidentally. <laughs> that it didn't really end in a way that gave anyone closure. At the end, Utena gets lost in the realm of darkness, and Anthe goes off looking for her, and they're never seen again until a f Uh, you didn't understand the ending. <laughs> You didn't understand the ending. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, though. Few more corporate acquisitions puts them in the next team. You know, did you just watch the movie? Did you fucking watch the Utena movie? Idiot. Because it's a retelling and a sequel. Anthe does find Utena. Go fucking watch the movie. <laughs> Kingdom Hearts game. So when that's your inspiration, your story is already kind of doomed to never come to a satisfying conclusion because melancholy grief is kind of all the show has going for it. There is an interesting theme in there about how you can't save someone from abuse by emulating the system that abused them in the first place, but it's buried under symbolism and knives. It runs a gauntlet of- uh, That is exactly what the ending is about, you idiot! <laughs> <laughs> you just don't understand anything you watch, do you? I didn't uh, see. I'm not even getting upset at the Steven Universe parts. I'm getting upset at the Utena parts. <laughs> oh God! Yes, the whole point of Utena is that girls get 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 shoved into either the role of princess or witch, and Utena chose prince. But all she is really doing is emulating the system that oppresses girls in the first place. Anthe herself is a failed revolutionary girl who has now been so repressed and oppressed she has barely any will of her own and can only act out in like tiny, tiny bits of near imperceptible passive aggression. Mm. Okay, I can't, I can't, if I, if I start talking about Utena, we're gonna be here all day and I'm never gonna finish this fucking video. Just, Lily Orca doesn't understand Utena. <laughs> ...of serious subjects that could have all served an entire show on their own, but here they're all haphazardly thrown into Darling Baby's trough, and most people only remember the show for being gay and covering heavy topics at all, and not about how- No, that's how people who have only heard of Utena think about it. They just think it's like, wee, lesbians, but no, it's actually- 
I mean, it's it, Utena like Steven Universe is a messy show. I would in fact say Utena is messier than Steven Universe. Has a real big tone shift, like just in the middle of the show. They were making up a lot of this shit as they went along. They, they honestly were. And the director was trying to make everything gay while everyone else was resisting him. <laughs> so that's why it ended up the way it was. I think Utena is still a very fascinating piece of media. It's very influential. It's very important. Uh, but it is a hot fucking mess that had barely any animation budget, so keep that in mind if you watch it. I would say it's good, but, like I said, with a caveat, keep in mind that it's very low budget, its production was very strange, um, and contentious, and, um, it ended up being more abstract than anything. I was talking to somebody about it on, uh, Twitter recently, actually, because they were like, Oh, yeah, there's a lot of, like, uh, <clears throat> heavy, weird stuff in this show, and they're supposed to be in middle school, and I'm like, look, I'm pretty sure even the show forgets they're supposed to be in middle school by, like, episode five, so just pretend they're in college and literally nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I saw Utena as a teenager, so I'm a little attached to it, but rewatching it as an adult, I'm like, yeah, it's gotta, <clears throat> it's... It's got some problems. <laughs> How well it does. Hell, most of the topics people claim it covers aren't actually in the show. It's in Adolescence of Utena, basically a movie rewrite. Oh, so you have seen the movie! <laughs> How did you not understand it's also a sequel? Ugh. That came out later. This is why any show inspired by Utena tends to have the same problems of just not grappling with cause and effect and cycling through serious issues without actually taking them seriously. Because nobody who watches Utena as an adult sees a revolutionary step forward in gay rep and anime. What they see is a fucking mess. But if you were a gay 13. Okay, I literally did just say that, but, um. You're acting like the purpose of it was to show gay rep, which it really wasn't. Because I think Lily has the same attitude that. A lot of modern meteor makers have, where it's like, we have to have representation, and they end up, like, making the most stereotypical bullshit, and pat themselves on the back for it, and it's annoying. I mean, you gotta remember that <clears throat> anime has a lot of what we would consider gay themes in the West, but Japan is still a rather homophobic country, and there is this thing in Japan where they have this idea that young girls will replicate relationships with each other before they're ready to be with men. Any woman who's a lesbian just hasn't grown out of that. That's how Japan thinks. So it was very easy to pass off Utena as one of these S-type shows where it's like, oh, these girls are just play-acting relationships with each other and they'll eventually move on. But the director was in there, like, making sure it was actually gay <laughs> at the same time. So that's kind of why it's, like, a little weird. <laughs> and also, like I said, Japan, not really the best when it comes to gay rights, but especially in the 90s. When Utena was made, it was made in the 90s, you also have to take that into consideration. You know. At this point, I assume most Japanese people shrivel up and die within weeks after graduating high school. I know, anime so often contrives reasons for things to take place in fucking high school. And like I said, Utena, like, basically just kind of forgets about that after a while. Like, ostensibly, the characters are supposed to be, like, 14 or something, but, like, they don't look it, they don't act it. <laughs> yeah. So, to me, I'm just like, whatever, just pretend they're in college, okay? Just, you know, you're allowed to like problematic media, I think, as long as you can admit that it is. Okay, Glacier, now, did you did you see the version where, um, where Michiru and Haruko were cousins, or... <laughs> I still can't believe they pulled that shit. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, um, in the, in the original Sailor Moon dub, they decided that, um, to cover up the fact that Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune, Haruko and Michiru, are gay, and they're quite blatantly a lesbian couple, they decided to say that they're cousins to explain their closeness. And that just made every American kid go, why are these cousins clearly fucking each other? <laughs> <laughs> year old back in the 90s, this show and bootleg copies of Sailor Moon were all you had. And so you'd covet those things and never really think critically about them. This is why Steven Universe thought nothing about taking a story regarding dysfunctional family dynamics and just throwing Nazis on top of it. Because they're not Nazis! 
Okay, here, here goes my here goes my uh, my rant about the diamonds. So, what do the diamonds do? They expand their civilization with no regard to the local ecosystem and wipe out several species doing so. Now, what other species can we think of that does something like that? I wonder. I wonder if there's another species out there that puts up, like, big concrete buildings over old swampland and displaces hundreds of animals and kills hundreds of more and leads to species going extinct. I wonder if there's some other horrible monster species out there in the universe that does this. <sighs> like... Obvious environmental message in a children's show, and it went directly over your fucking head. <laughs> but no, no, they're Nazis because Steven makes a comment about them being dictators because Steven will just, like, like say these dark things every once in a while, and it's really funny. So, yeah, it was supposed to be, like, a joke because Steven just says shit like that, like, really out of pocket sometimes. Like, when he describes Malachite as a fusion boiling the ocean with hatred, like... <laughs> Where does he get this shit from? Steven, you okay? Because Utena does the same thing. Take a story about abuse and then layer cosmic stakes on top of it until you've forgotten why you're here. Some people call this show psych- uh, uh, Look. The really heavy stuff doesn't usually end- doesn't usually- like, like it changes. The really heavy stuff doesn't enter Utena until like, the second half. After the Black Rose Saga. That's really when they decided to shift the- the, the the framing to abuse and like this and really really analyzing the situation that Anthe is in as the Rose Bride. The Rose Bride being she um she is fought over by the duelists basically and she will serve whoever is her current fiance, quote unquote, who has won the recent duel. So she's like she's got magic powers, but she's also like being oppressed as in a servile role. Uh, and, and then the, the show really starts to examine it. Because, like, Utana kind of starts out as, like, almost a normal magical girl show, kind of. Like, it still has the that weird art deco aesthetic and shit going on. But it really starts out way more goofy than it ends up. Like, seriously. <laughs> Like, just any Nanami episode is, is just utter nonsense. <laughs> Psychedelic, and yeah, it does often feel like it was written on drugs. I will say it's the perfect show for anyone who ever wanted to see Irish Shank Misty in the back with a fucking rapier. That's just quality television right there. Oh, I would it love to hear what you think about that scene, Lily, because I'm sure you're going to get every fucking detail of it wrong. <laughs> experience but if you ask it is still so funny that i'm getting more angry about these utana takes than the fucking steven universe takes i wasn't expecting this i wasn't expecting to get this riled up today <laughs> me to find a model for writing stories about abuse or gay relationships this would not be a show i would tell you to emulate it already because it wasn't aiming to be about gay relationships god damn it <laughs> Except for the director. The director was the only one making it all gay. Hi, Skrill! Guess what? Lily Orkin is pissing me off with opinions about Utena in a fucking Stevie Universe video, and I'm angry about it! <laughs> okay, I'm not that angry. I'm just playing it up for humor. I'm gonna eat more of my chicken I have over here. Nom, 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 nom. In case Lillian Orcadio watches this and starts to, like, say, like, I'm a, I'm a whiny Stevie Universe fan who can't take any criticism. Yeah, so the usual. Me just screaming into the microphone and busting everyone's eardrums because I go Super Saiyan 2 when I'm angry. <laughs> hey, Shin Goob! We're only 14 minutes into the goddamn Lily Orchid video and I've been streaming for an hour, so, you know, buckle up, kids! <laughs> He does way more than its writer is capable of handling, and a fan of that is not going to improve on it in any way. So what you end up with is... But... <sighs> Mpeka Sugar was never emulating Utena with TV Universe. It was just visual inspiration. Because for all of its flaws, and all of its weirdness, and all of its fucking... Just odd decisions and tonal problems, Utena is a very beautiful show, even with the very limited animation. They did a lot to make it look good with a very, very small budget. And that is definitely one thing that makes it worth watching. But again, you are going to see those goddamn fight animations at least twice per episode after a while. Like, like the reason I recognize the Utana references in Steam Universe is because I've seen Utana do that fucking backflip like a thousand times. <laughs> Especially when I was making anime music videos in my 20s. 
Hey, a small one. Hey, everybody. So if anyone who's coming in a little late, we're watching Lily Orchard's recent video on Steven Universe, and I'm getting more angry at the takes on Revolutionary Girl Utena than anything else. So let, let's fucking go. It's almost Revolutionary Girl Utena fan fiction, and you have to remember that Utena was- Utena! 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 God damn it, it pronounced it correctly! <laughs> ready Princess Knight fan fiction. And after a certain point, you're just inbreeding. It's why you have all those American- Uh, excuse me, it wasn't Princess Knight fan fiction, it was Rosa Versailles fan fiction. God, fucking fake weebs. <laughs> it shows about kids going to anime warrior school, and the fact that there's such a thing as anime warrior school is just never questioned, because a show they liked had it- why are and we talking Harry Potter? Why are we talking about High Guardian Spice now? Though I have said in the past that High Guardian Spice is what Steven Universe haters think Steven Universe is. <laughs> like, no joke. Uh, speaking of Harry Potter, uh, Pearl's entire story is about how she's still hung up on her first crush who has died a tragic death and is coping, or rather sabotaging her own mental health, by spending the rest of her existence watching over the son she had with someone to... else. So there's a cursed thought- so, yeah, that's a that's a fucking reach cuz she's not like torturing children because she's a she's an angry incel. For you. So Pearl's story keeps running that treadmill because where else is it going to go? No, I might I might have to get a little zooted for this. I don't know. I I got my weed here, so we'll we'll see. <laughs> They wanted it to be like Utena, but because Utena had an open ending, you're kind of stuck with it. Now that's fine. It's not an open ending. Oh my god. <laughs> You just do not understand metaphors, do you? Oh my god. Like, the whole point of the ending is Anthe has the power to leave the school. Finally. On her own terms. Under her own will. Because Utena finally reached the true her who's been suffering in her grave this entire time. <laughs> Uh, the Anthe we see is like a shell, a shell of her throughout the show. Uh. No, I don't do drunk streams anymore, because I don't drink that much anymore. I smoke weed like an adult. Where'd my pipe go? <laughs> I had it earlier. That's alright, I have a joint here, it's fine. We're, I guess it, wait, which strain is this? <laughs> uh, oh, it's Gorilla OG, good. We'll get a little zooted while we uh, listen to this motherfucker talk about this crap. And I'm going to keep trying to ink. I'm having a real hard time drawing the, the pummel of Rose's sword here. By the way, if you haven't been following what I'm doing on the art art thing, um, Connie is going to throw Rose's sword to... Spinel. Ha! I didn't forget about the children, see? I planned this all along. I actually did, actually. Celestial Alapricorn gave me the... Uh, Gave me the idea for this ending to the fight, like, two years ago. <laughs> or something. Because um, I thought of, I thought of it a while ago, but it was like, I had to, like, actually get down and draw it all. So, and like, we keep joking, it took me, like, a fucking year. But, you know, it, I'm learning to, I'm learning to produce a little faster now, okay? I promise. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, let's take a break to say, that's what, th this is what's happening here. Uh, Connie is gonna toss her the sword, and that's when it, it's gonna get her to get Jasper to back the fuck off. Because that sword could poof her, like, instantly. So, you know. Uh, see, the thing about modern media and writing is a lot of it inspired from very, uh, serious analysis of revolution or big impact on my life shows. And then they... Yeah, but it's like, being slightly influenced by Utena doesn't mean, like, they were trying to replicate its themes with Steven Universe. Because, like, when people say Utena has a lot of heavy content in it, they're right. Like, a while back, I was like, why is everyone giving content warnings for Utena? What the hell? And then I was reading through it. I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that happens. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, right, oh, oh, yeah. Because, like, back in my day, like, the first time I saw Utena was on an a fan-subbed VHS, and it was just an episode tagged on to the end of uh, a Fushigyugi uh, a fan sub, which nobody probably even knows what the fuck that is anymore. <laughs> so, that was my first experience with the show. Basically, Lily is right. We got whatever we could back then. And, you know, we didn't really question it very much. So, But nowadays, it's like, you know, you might want to know about the, the abuse and the... 
the the, uh, the the sexual assaults and the incest and the, all this other stuff in Utana, yeah, that, that is there. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's not in Steven Universe. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fine for Utena because it only had 40 episodes and it's serialized. Steven Universe has 180. That's certainly a long time to do fuck all. The crew is aware of this too. American and Japanese shows just have different episode numbers. Like, most anime is either going to have, like, 12, 26, 40 episodes, or it's just going to be indefinite, like fucking One Piece and Dragon Ball Z. You know, there's, like, nothing in between. It's either 12, 26, 40, or just goes on forever. <laughs> so... <laughs> American shows, we have longer seasons, typically. Uh, especially in television. And, and Steven Universe was kind of... It kind of came out in, like, the last gasp of network television. So that's... I think that's also why the episode amount is a little strange. Especially in season one. So... Too, because they spend a lot, oops, a lot of time distracting... I just... I just full screen that. I, I should actually probably just full screen it, huh? But, uh, Lily also doesn't understand, if I recall, how fucking network TV shows work. Because I remember the first two-hour video, there being a point like, Well, they should have planned around the airing schedule for these plot points. They should have planned around the Steven bombs. And it's like, a network orders episodes of a show... They get the episodes, and then they air them whenever the fuck they want. The creators have no control over it. Like, you don't even understand how the process works. <laughs> the viewer with shiny baubles, particularly musical numbers. When people try to point to this story being done well, they usually point to Mr. Greg, because Pearl sings about how Rose chose Greg over her, and it's certainly loud and epic. The reason why Mr. Greg is so impressive is that they managed to fit, like, a full musical into an 11-minute episode. They had to plan this episode down to, like, the second in order to get it to work. That's why it's impressive, you fucking knobhead. <laughs> it can climactic, as Pearl does her best impression of a Kingdom Hearts character, but it's hollow and empty. It's- This is like the second or third Kingdom Hearts reference! Why?! <laughs> Using a musical number to sort of yada yada over the fact that you're watching Pearl do this song and dance, literally, for the tenth goddamn time. No, the- Yada yada over it? That's like the first big- That's like- That song is the first time we get, like, direct confirmation that Pearl was in love with Rose. Like, up- Like, my first watch, up until that point, I was like, okay. Okay, I could see- Pearl being in love with Rose, but they're gonna probably keep it subtext because they can't really show that in a children's show. And then we get hit with It's Over, isn't it? And they just blatantly show that Pearl was in love with her, and I was very pleasantly surprised by that. I was like, oh, oh they're actually just saying it. Wow. Holy shit. That's amazing. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, they still, they still made it subtle enough for the straights, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> the actually good episode about this is Rose's Scabbard. This is the first time Pearl has had to confront the fact that Pink kept secrets from her. Pearl thought she knew everything about Pink. Yeah. She thought she was the only one who truly knew her. Regardless of anything else, like the fact that Pink chose Greg over her, the fact that she gave up her life- Well, yeah, of course Pearl would cling to this because she threw away her whole life on Homeworld for Rose, you know, to go along with this. And she's the only one who- who knows that Rose is Pink Diamond. She is keeping that immense of a secret in her. So of course she gets a little triggered when it turns out that Rose kept secrets even from her, because she knows the biggest secret. Yeah, it's not the most mature reaction, but people have emotions, and their emotions don't always make them work, like, operate in the most rational way. You know, almost like gems are people. <sighs> I don't know. It sounded like Peridot was Lily's favorite character, but... Which, I mean, fair, that's valid. Peridot's great. Peridot's not one of my favorites, but I still really like her. <laughs> Life to have a little son of Geode. Pearl at least had the fact that she was the one person Pink shared everything with. Yes! Exactly! That's why she freaks out! It's a very human reaction. 
And that's the point. Gems are just people, but, you know, because they're gems, they can they don't operate one-to-one -one on human things, so stuff with gems can be very broad metaphors for all sorts of life problems. That's that's the brilliant of, brilliance of the writing of Steven Universe right there. That Above anything else, all the gem stuff works on a metaphorical and emotional level, so they can, it can be... It can be a metaphor for an analogy for, like, various things. So, and that money people can relate to on different levels. Her only real confidant. Well, it turns out she doesn't even have that. Pink kept secrets from her, too, and it causes her to completely break down. This is probably the only episode that's even better in hindsight. Steven Universe likes to pretend it's weaving this intricate plot web, but like most stories, they're making it up as they go along. But presumably, Rose had a secret identity with scribbled on a post-it note. Oh, right. I'm pretty sure Lily hates the, the pink diamond twist, even though it's set up literally from, like, the beginning. As much as I say they didn't have anything- they didn't have anything planned in season one and didn't know where the fuck they were going with anything, the whole rose being pink diamond thing was very obviously cooked in from the beginning. You know, like, there's just no cap, you know? <laughs> Somewhere, and this is the only place where it feels like they thought about that. Anyway, the reason this episode is- WHAT?! HOW?! Even Pearl covering her mouth is set up right there. Look, Jay, I will say the young people slang if I want to, damn it. I'm over 30, I can say it until it's uncool, and then I'll ruin it for you forever. It's great. That's the great part about being old, is fucking with young people. <laughs> <laughs> is so good is because when Steven finally chases Pearl down, Pearl just talks, mostly to herself, and we get her processing her feelings out loud. And one thing we really learn here is that Pearl hasn't really accepted that Pink is really gone. She openly wonders- YES! IT'S BEEN 14 YEARS! And nobody knows how Steven works at this point! Steven could very well be Rose reincarnated without any memories. For all anyone knows at this point. So, of course, she's uncertain about it. Nobody knows how this works. I'm pretty sure Rose only had was able to have Steven the way she did because she's a fucking diamond. Like, seriously. Rose Quartz, as a character, makes no sense unless she's Pink Diamond. Like, seriously. It is that baked in. <laughs> if Steven has her memories. Pearl really is aimless and adrift, alone for the first yes! time in her life. She doesn't know what to do. Remember what I said about how the show never lets a quiet moment sit? Well, here it does. Sometimes Are you actually praising this I for wonder once? if she can see me through your eyes. Oh, Dee Dee, you're so good. What would she think of me now? Well, I think you're pretty great. He's such a good boy. I don't think Steven really knows how much that means to her. This moment is absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most gut-wrenching moments I have ever seen in a cartoon, and it didn't need a big flashy dance number, fight scene, or death trap to do it. It didn't need a celebrity cameo or a guest animator to do it. All it needs. No, oh, there's there's the salt about Takafumi Hori again. They, they got a guest animator to try to trick us into thinking their show is good. Like I said earlier, I don't. I said I was gonna do Ben Shapiro for my impression, and then I just went into Red X's like neckbeard voice for some reason. They said it was good. <laughs> anyway, yeah, as I remember from the two-hour video, Lily being like, they had to bring in a guest animator just to make a decent-looking episode. Me, me, me. Takafumi Hori is just a fan of Steven Universe. He's a really big fan of Steven Universe, so he wanted to animate on the show. That's that's why he has guest animation spots around his work for Trigger. You know, he couldn't go. He couldn't come in like a single man couldn't come animate the whole show. I'm sorry, uh, he's got other shit to do. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, why the why did Rose not just adopt a baby? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna give my my uh, thoughts on why Rose made Steven. I think it is open-ended, and it's meant to be open-ending, and it should just be open-ended. Because we should never really get Rose's own thoughts, because the whole point is, Steven is never going to be able to truly ro know Rose as a person. He can only know her through the eyes of other people. And that's gonna go for, like, any kid who has a dead parent who they've only ever heard about, you know? It's kind of like that. So, he's never gonna really know what her exact thoughts and motives were, and it should stay that way. Because, again, and I think that's why they didn't bring her back in the end. Like, I was very sure they weren't gonna bring Rose back, 
in Change Your Mind. But they gave me just enough doubt that that part was really intense. <laughs> and I applaud that. Um, but thematically, she should stay dead because, like, any any kid with a dead parent isn't going to magically get their parent back and learn who they were from themselves, are they? So, thematically, yeah, we should never know Rose's own thoughts on things. But, that being said, my theory is Rose wanted to, in some way, become part of the life cycle of the Earth because the planet meant so much to her. And, and gave her the kind of life she always wanted. Uh, and maybe to an immortal being, the idea of passing away and becoming components of the next generation of life could be like a fascinating concept to her or a desirable concept to her. I, I don't like these interpretations that are all like, Rose committed suicide. I think that's a little too simplistic. I think... Yeah, she wanted to become part of the life cycle of the Earth, and she wanted to become in some way human. So she is now half of a human being. So, in some regard. I mean, the gem the gem left behind is basically, I guess, her corpse? <laughs> if you want to put it that way. And Steven does, and Mr. Greg. He lifts up his shirt and goes, don't forget mom! And Greg and Pearl are both kind of like, eh, don't say it, don't put it that way, kid. <laughs> You don't have to say it that way. <laughs> but yeah, that's my theory on why Rose had Steven. I think she wanted to become part of the life cycle of the Earth, and I think that appealed to her and a mortal being. Uh, that makes the most sense to me. Needed was a writer who knew what the fuck they were doing. Sorry, did I say knew what the fuck they were doing? I meant decided to actually put in some work that... Here we go with the digs at Rebecca Sugar for no goddamn reason. This is what I always say. Like, did Rebecca Sugar run over your dog? Did she piss in your Cheerios? Did she kill your mom? I mean, what is this? <laughs> Day. I've said this the whole time. Becky can make great art when she's not getting distracted by anime references and her fucking giggle squee. Day I mean, how many anime references are there even in Steven Universe? It's not a whole lot. And even the ones that are there, like, if you don't get the reference it still makes sense in context. Because I've seen the references just go over people's heads before. Like, cheesy live blogs not recognizing that all of them clapping and saying congratulations on the test is a is a blatant reference to Evangelion. <laughs> which made me feel old. Um, all, all the anime references are like old Taku shit, too. Which is funny. But, like, like there's no, like... There's no, like, really distracting ones. There's no anime reference in Steven Universe that... Would it make sense in the context of the episode if you didn't know it was even a reference? You know? And that's the best way to reference things. So I, I don't even fucking know. You better not... You, uh, we're gonna watch the movie one too, maybe. You better not be getting in on the fucking Akira slide, because everybody and their brother references that. <laughs> this is what Rose's story was missing for most of the show. We don't need to necessarily know who Rose is, we just need to know someone who did. And Pearl got a lot of screen time, but screen time in Steven Universe doesn't... Okay, see, I do agree, at least with this part. I think Pearl speedrunning Pink Diamond's backstory is basically the worst piece of writing in the entire show. I, I, really, I really think that should have been fleshed out more and had more time spent on it. And I, it just feels like... Because, like, what happens? Garnet breaks apart over, over Rose being pink and Sapphire runs off. They go find Sapphire after, like... An indeterminate amount of time. It could have been like half an hour for all we know. And she's crying and she's upset. And Pearl goes, no, no, no. Listen, everything you think Pink did bad wasn't that bad. Listen to me. The number one Rose Quartz fangirl in the world who was there and totally isn't biased. It just, <laughs> it just, it just, it does feel like they're hand-waving Pink's backstory a little bit. Like, oh crap, we gotta get all this shit in before the show ends. I just think they could have done that part better. And I think Sapphire comes around a little too quickly. But it is what it is. <laughs> Equate to development. Between Rose's scabbard and volleyball, Pearl's grief is usually wallpapered over with musical numbers. This really comes to a head in the okay, bad version of Rose's scabbard, version. volleyball. Okay. During this episode, while trying to heal Pink Pearl's scar, always a silly notion, scars don't actually heal, Pearl takes the two of them to the- But they're gems, you- Yeah, scars don't heal on humans because we're made of flesh and bone. This bitch is made of light. 
<laughs> and they make it very clear in the episode that the scar is psychosomatic. Uh... <laughs> Sanchini says, Lily Orchard, Rebecca Sugar replaced by three-year-old golden retriever with an eight-year-old golden retriever, so I have I would have less time to spend with him before he dies. Yeah, I hate her. <laughs> we just gotta keep making up reasons for why Lily Orchard hates Rebecca Sugar, because it's funny as shit to me. <laughs> ...the reef to try and repair her. But it turns out that the scar on her face isn't an injury. It's from an injury that was so impactful that it manifested as a part of her physical form. Yeah, it's so psychosomatic. It's this does have a good moment where Pink Pearl says she's fine and her No, so it's, to... so it's psychosomatic! It's not, like, a physical problem, it's a mental one. That was the entire fucking point! <laughs> ...immediately contradict her. Because <laughs> guess what? Because it's almost like Garnet at the beginning of the series is talking to a bunch of gems in her yoga class about how their physical forms reflect their mental... Uh, ...state. And it's almost like it's thematically relevant to fucking Steven turning into a kaiju at the end. You know? Almost like, yeah, there's themes and shit, man. <laughs> it's just... I don't know. Oh, <laughs> uh, she's just like me. Okay, I said that as a joke, but like, during the writing of this video, I actually did make another appointment with, with my therapist and unpack the fact that the only positive rela relationship I had as a child was a lie, and was actually- Okay, Lily, nobody gives a shit about your personal life. Like, yeah, right, please stop trauma dumping in your Steven Universe hate videos, it's very disconcerting. <laughs> This would be me, this would be like me coming on stream and going, Hey guys, let me tell you about all my ex-girlfriends and, and this one relationship I had that was really fucked up. Like, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear me laugh at things and draw. <laughs> Which I'm not doing currently. <laughs> Actually quite abusive, and that's partly why I'm so bad at having relationships with people. So if a moment like this ever makes you go, Oh, she just like me for real. Just, just stop and think about that for a minute. Okay, let's continue. Okay, uh -huh. so Pearl assumes it was white, but when Pink She's Pearl- She's almost like all these situations are meant to be relatable to the people watching or something. Like, that's the point. <laughs> this isn't even a criticism about the show, it's just like, oh, I, I related to this character that I called my therapist. Somehow this is Rebecca Sugar's fault. Pearl corrects her and says it was pink. Pearl goes into full denial because this is a pink diamond Pearl never knew. A childish brat who threw destructive tantrums and kept breaking yeah. her toys. It's an interesting moment where both of them have to confront the fact that at some point, pink diamond changed from explosive and angry. Oh no, Lily's really gonna hate the Mega Pearl fusion because it's a reference. Just, just, let's just wait, let's just wait. <laughs> Great, to reclusive and secretive. Or at least it would be if Steven didn't throw a tantrum and accidentally trap them both in a lobotomy clam, and so now they have to have the really short version of that scene from Rose's Scabbard before quickly fusing into another Utena reference and having a rushed action scene. My god, you were almost there! You Rushed action scene?! That action scene goes on for like two minutes! <laughs> in an eleven minute episode! <laughs> We could have had another scene like that one in Rose's Scabbard. There's an exchange in the clam that would have been so good if it was longer and quieter, but the f <laughs> An exchange in the clam. I really like that sentence for some reason. That's gonna be like the, my next album. <laughs> an exchange in the clam. <laughs> fucking showrunner is a fucking chipmunk with a sugar high. It's like getting the Cliff Notes version of a much longer, more focused story. That moment where Volleyball asks Pearl how she stopped hurting and Pearl just says, I didn't, is really good. Because the yes! thing about trauma is that it never really leaves you. You can manage yes! it forever, but it affects everything about you. Pearl's the hell time is with that? Pink are her formative What's years, that? and they're called formative years for a reason. They stick with you and influence everything you are as a person for good or ill. Childhood or early life trauma will always stick with you far more than adult trauma will because your brain has grown and developed around it. It affects the really deep-seated aspects of your personality. And that's- <laughs> Gee, Lily, are we doing some introspection on this CV Universe hate video? Are you starting to realize the reason you're such a piece of shit is, is you're undealt with trauma, maybe? <laughs> hey, Peter, you want to go to the clam? Oh my god, Lois. Oh my god, Lois, let's have an exchange in the clam. <laughs> oh, I'm getting goofy. Obviously, I need to get a little more zooted. <laughs> Lily, Rebecca Sugar poses my therapist and called me out on my behavior and made me feel bad about myself, so I hate her. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's interesting. Let's really dig into it. Dissect Pearl's brain in as many ways as you possibly can. Early seasons were pretty good at this, like when Connie asked Pearl to teach her to fight, and Pearl taught her to be a meat shield, because that's basically how she understands being a soldier. That's interesting. It shows how her relationship with Pink has affected her thought processes everywhere. But almost every instance after that, it just reminds you, oh hey, 
Pearl's crush is dead. Pearl's not over it. I'll remind you again. And I her crush? They were clearly in a relationship, but obviously uh, Rose would never let it be as deep as Pearl wanted it to be. And then Rose left her for a man, so that has to sting extra hard. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's why you don't bait. That's why you don't date bi chicks. No, I'm kidding. Mostly, half joking. I'm not gonna trauma dump now too. <laughs> An hour. Pearl's grief and how she deals with it and how it affects her day to day thinking is interesting. But you know what else would be interesting? Seeing what Pearl gets up to when she's not being reminded about how she got cucked by the lead guitarist of a fog hat cover band. Like I don't know, an episode where she warps. No, he's a SoundCloud rapper. Get it right. <laughs> Brazil and learns capoeira and takes part in a competition and has sapphic tension with her opponent in the finals. I mean, you like anime so much, do a sapphic tournament arc. That'd be fun. I'm not asking for her to get over it. I'm asking to see her make some progress because <coughs> that's satisfying. I want to get to the... She gets a whole ass bismuth in future. Come on now. Bismuth is a very good uh, reward for all of her pain and suffering. I, I, I should say so. Uh... I might be a little weak to a lady with dreadlocks myself, I'm just saying. <laughs> Next episode where it's time to open the grief box again and think, you know what? She's been doing pretty good for herself. I'm proud of her. It's not enough to just tell me what happened off screen. Let's see it. I'm kind of reminded of how Legend of Korra just kind of glossed over Korra learning the four elements on the basis that the previous show was already about that. But the point that it misses entirely is that the adventure to learn Why are we talking about- isn't just about- Why are we talking about Legend of Korra now? We've gone like- Kingdom Hearts, Utena, which is at least related, now Legend of Korra, we Lily! Lily, stay on topic! Pay attention! Maybe you need to go to your therapist for ADHD. <laughs> about learning the elements. It's about the Avatar broadening our horizons and meeting people from diverse backgrounds and learning to really appreciate every culture on the planet. Not holding up in a compound completely isolated from other people. Bismuth making the business happen. Yeah. <laughs> in perspectives. This is why Sozin and Roku grew up. cannot get this Sozin remained in the right isolated and that's how imperialism so festers. Roku traveled the world and so of course he's not on board with Sozin taking over the world in the name of the Fire Nation because the world is already beautiful. And you'd know that if you stepped outside your walled garden. The interesting part of a story is seeing how characters grow as people. You shouldn't just skip over that and jump right to the end. Oh, but Lily, you still get it, so that means it's good the way it is. Oh, by that logic, why even bother animating it? Just tweet your- Excuse me, was that supposed to be me? How dare you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> your outline and then make a Tumblr blog where you talk about your OCs and never write anything. The execution of a story is the fun part. Getting off Pearl for a second and getting onto Pink Diamond, I always found it a little skeezy the way the show spends so much time analyzing every single bad thing Pink Diamond ever did because Pink Diamond's crimes are fucking minuscule compared to the rest of the diamonds. You get these big- Yeah, almost like we're given looks into Pink's life. So we can understand why she became Rose and made the decisions she made. And we can have sympathy for her while also understanding that she has some pretty severe character flaws like everybody else on the show. It's almost like... It's almost like that's a fucking point or something. Yeah, it's true. Korra also starts with, um... She's older than Aang was when he was learning. Also, though, I mean, Korra's kind of a mess, but that's also, like, a lot of network meddling caused that. Um, I like Korra. I do say, though, if you want to just watch only seasons three and four, I would not blame you. Uh, season two is the worst. Uh, it has some stuff in it I really like, but uh, objectively, story-wise, it is the worst. <laughs> Big, elaborate musical numbers about- Season one is just kind of boring. Every horrible thing Pink Diamond ever did, like all two of them, and it's such a- That was not about Pink, that was about Spinel's backstory! The whole song was about Spinel's situation, Pink just happened to be involved in it. Oh my Christ, I don't understand people who think that the whole point of Spinel is just to demonize Rose. Like, this is just what her backstory is. It's a retcon, but it fits into the- It's a good retcon because it fits logically into the story. <laughs> so. A point of drama and wait for like half the show, but then the actual tyrannical oppressors show up and they're basically just silly little aunts. To say Beck- Yeah, but, but, but Steven is still like not comfortable with them. But how characters like, how characters are depicted in Steven Universe- tends to change as Steven gets to know them. 
the first appearance of each diamond was very eerie and alien and inhuman. And now that he knows them better, he's seeing... He's seeing what idiots they are, basically. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. They weren't big, scary monsters. They were always just kind of dumb. <laughs> I see. I get it now. <laughs> like Jasper, too. Like Jasper in Future is way more funny than she is in, uh, in the OG show. I mean, she's still like the exact same character, but, you know, we get to see the more, uh, the more openly petulant side of her. <laughs> Which is what made her one of my favorite characters. <laughs> These priorities are out of whack would be an understatement to end all understatements, but on reflection, I noticed this in other places too. One of the things- His, like, Steven's priorities? Because he's just like, he's just trying to shove Spedel off with the diamonds to get rid of two problems at once there. I mean, can you blame the kid? He just wants a nap. <laughs> the of the show is that none of the gems are perfect parents, but Steven still forgives them because he loves them, right? Well, when you look up the number of times the gems mess up, a trend pops up. Per Nobody is a perfect parent. Nobody ever anywhere is a perfect Perfect parent. There's no such thing as being a perfect parent. Unless what? We're gonna like raise kids in like the most clinical scientific way to to min max their 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 mental well being or or you know adjustability to society. That's that doesn't sound dystopian at all. <laughs> Pearl and Amethyst mess up their parents. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have smoked, or maybe I should smoke more. I, don't, I haven't decided yet. Parenting <laughs> and traumatize Stephen the most, while Garnet, Ruby, and Sapphire mess up like twice. However, the two times Garnet messes up are also one of the few times. Did he say Garnet and Sapphire? Did he say Garnet only messes up like twice? Wait a minute. I'm Hold up. <laughs> Pops up. Pearl and Amethyst mess up their parenting and traumatize Stephen the most, while Garnet, Ruby, and Sapphire mess up like twice. However. Oh, okay, he's counting Ruby and Sapphire as the same thing as Garnet, which is fair. I think Garnet messes up more than twice, though. I mean, there's getting Greg kidnapped to space. Uh, that that was pretty big. Um, there was not believing Steven when Peridot was showing up with the Robinoids. There was uh, trying to take the mirror from Steven. Um, what else did Garnet fuck up? I don't know, probably something. <laughs> this this scene with him standing on the fucking roof, yeah, probably, too. She ended up just scaring him and making him paranoid by accident while trying to share her powers with him. <laughs> the two times Garnet messes up are also one of the few times in the show Steven responds with anger at the way he's being treated. When Garnet accidentally scares Steven by teaching him what future vision is, he gets angry even though he was the one that doubled down. When Ruby and Sapphire act a mess in public, Steven yells at them. When Pearl almost lets Steven fall to his death, when Pearl brainwashes Connie to be Steven's warrior slave, when Pearl almost gets herself and Steven killed by flying in a DIY spaceship, when Pearl invades Garnet's boundaries, when Pearl does anything, Steven starts jumping to hugging it out. It's pretty fucked up. Now, the Watsonian critique could suggest that Steven- I mean, I don't think either Pearl or Steven appreciated the danger that her fucking makeshift spaceship was, was going to cause. Like... <laughs> Pearl's still a gem, okay? She's a little naive about the the uh, the capacity for Earthlings to survive things still, I think. <laughs> Even it's just accustomed to Pearl being nuttier than rat crap in a pistachio factory, while Garnet can usually be counted on to be the actual adult in the room. But the real critique is another one of priorities. The writers are determined to get you to sympathize with Pearl, and so when she fucks up, it's usually excused or swept under the rug. I don't think you need to do that, though. A, a character- There was like a whole three-episode arc of Garnet not talking to her over the, the earlier thing you said about her, her, her violating Garnet's boundaries. Like, they had a fight, like, over several episodes about that. I mean, there were consequences. You know, unlike Lapis, who never gets any fucking consequences. That's another rant for another day. <laughs> they can still held accountable for their actions. You're not going to tarnish Pearl in the eyes of the fanbase if Garnet or Greg have to give her an earful every once in a while. Or you might. The fanbase has rocks for brains, after all. The crew seems very afraid of criticizing Pearl at all, and so they do everything in their power what? to blunt all of her actions, and that usually means Steven forgiving her. <laughs> I mean, Pearl is wrong very often. She's very rude to Greg. She's often saying, like, very insensitive things just that she thinks are helpful, <laughs> but they're really not. I mean, we're obviously not supposed to think she's a perfect character, and we're supposed to laugh at her foibles most of the time. And I do, because Dee Dee is a, is a fantastic voice actor with the best, like, dry humor delivery I've ever heard in my life. And as I always say, I don't have a crush on Pearl. I have a crush on Dee Dee Magnol Hall. <laughs> 
<laughs> Steven is the show's moral center, and if he approves of something, the fan base usually will too. In fact, it's a common deflection tactic of the Diamond's Redemption arc because people will say, oh, they weren't redeemed because Steven hasn't forgiven them? Which always struck me as a strange argument. They weren't redeemed because Steven hasn't actually forgiven them? Yeah, that is my argument, so I said it in the same voice. You wanna fight about it? <laughs> because Steven isn't one of their victims. It's not up to him. Look Steven's not one of their victims?! <laughs> I'm like John Travolta looking around right now, what the fuck? How, how is Steven not a victim of the diamonds? I mean, A, his mom was, and like, a lot of the shit she left behind is directly because of them. And also, they, like, put him on trial and tried to kill him. I mean, I would say he's one of their victims, yeah. Like, they they literally tried to kill him. <laughs> Look, just, just stop taking shortcuts. Unpack Pearl's behavior. People will get it. It's almost like there's this fear people will condemn Pearl at the first opportunity, but people- You mean like you? You seem to hate her quite a bit because of, like, very understandable mistakes she makes due to her emotions and her past trauma. So is trauma supposed to, like, be excusable and explain people's actions, or is it not Lillian or Cadio? You might want to, like, fucking ask a therapist about that. They might have some opinions on that. People don't <laughs> usually do that unless they're bigoted or it's immediately clear that this character is your baby. And look, I've got no stones to throw in this regard. I'm a writer myself. I have characters for whom I go, that's my baby. They have never done anything wrong in their life. Oh. But you don't have to be a- You sh d d That is the wrong way to write, actually. I'm get, I am getting zooted. I'm, I'm having another toke here. Look, <clears throat> I am a very big proponent of the concept of kill your darlings. I do believe Stephen King coined it. What kill your darlings means is if something isn't working for the story, whether it be a scene, a concept, a character, no matter how much you love that idea and really, really want it to be in there, or love that character and really, really want it to be in there, if it's not working for the plot, you get rid of it. Kill your darlings. So no, you should not be writing a story and be thinking of your main character as my precious baby who can do no wrong because you will write a bad fucking story if you do that. I don't even know what this is. Is this from something? It looks like... It looks like Avatar almost, but... I'm not sure. Afraid of people not being on board with it. Here's a dirty secret that I've known for years. People will get on board with any idea if you tell a good story. Oh, it's a Star Wars OC. Oh, it's a Jedi. Okay. That's that's why the robes. All right, I get it. <laughs> and tell it well. If it takes you a while, people are fine with that. You don't have to preemptively try and counter internet grumbling. Let them grumble. There's always the risk that after a bad episode, your Twitter mentions are going to be flooded. But honestly, I think showrunners should just not have Twitter anyway. That's just bad for you. And Pearl is one of- I mean, I- okay. Oh my god. Oh no, the worst person you know just made a good point. <laughs> Stop clock is right two times a day. Yes. Showrunners, stay off of fucking Twitter. Everybody on there is batshit insane. D just don't even. Unless your goose works and you're like super fucking based. One of those characters who is never going to have a good first impression. You watch the first two seasons and you won't get the feeling that this is someone who was... T Wait, you're saying she doesn't have a good first impression? I fucking loved Pearl from, from word go. I, that sounds like a defect on your on your part there, Lily. <laughs> ...toyed with and played for a fool. You'll get the feeling this is someone who can't take no for an answer. You'll probably wonder if this was Rose's creepy stalker. <laughs> That's the vibe I got from Pearl for a long time. But you know what? Okay, Pearl's not a Yandere, but can you imagine Yandere Pearl? That would, that would be pretty great, actually. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's X Twitter zitter now. <laughs> this is an X Twitter. It has ceased to be. Anyway, so like, okay, so that was your personal weird first impression of Pearl. That doesn't mean it's like the universal one that everybody gets when they watch the show. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a concept of mind? Do you understand that other people have different thoughts than you do? Y y y yeah, y you can think beyond the level of a toddler. Correct. I hope. Yes. <laughs> That's fine. More information came out and I was like, yeah, alright, I'm on board. However, I do think Pearl's story, and indeed many character stories, take way too long to get to the fucking point. You don't need this much setup, you don't need this much filler, you don't need any filler. I have no idea why so many Beach City episodes are in the- actually, no, that's a lie, I do know. See, back in the 80s and 90s, most action-adventure anime were made as adaptations of comic books, but for some boneheadedly stupid reason, the decision to adapt a comic into an anime was- Oh, are you actually trying to, like, make the it is literally filler argument? Because I- 
I, even I don't agree with that, and I hate most of the Townie episodes. <laughs> ...made exactly 0.4 seconds after the first issue hit shelves. So a lot of these shows end up catching up to the comic book and needing to fill time with filler seasons while the writer... Yeah, okay, we know what filler is. Can the we get back is, to talking about Steven Japanese Universe? Japanese comic books are usually... Oh my god, how long does this go on?! <laughs> and so for the longer, more elaborate shows, those filler arcs were getting okay, happens when we're... one person can't create infinitely, but the money men demand constant, constant Oh profit. my fucking god, we know what filler them. is, Lily! Lily! <laughs> didn't really think anything of filling the story with filler oh. episodes that do not... I wasn't, I wasn't... I wasn't intending to skip parts of the episode, but dear fucking god. And no, they didn't put these episodes in because they think filler is a normal part of anime. You, you brainlit. Nobody thinks that. Like, anime fans understand what filler is. We're the ones who coined the term. Um, actually, Lily, Rebecca said that every episode is important and there is no filler. I'm sure she believes that. But then you get something like Steven and the Stevens, which is supposed to explain how time travel works, but then they never use time travel again. All of this waffling has real effects. The last arc of the show before it was cancelled was cut horrendously short, and it didn't need to be if they had just gotten to it a lot quicker. See, Cartoon Network wanted Ruby and Sapphire's wedding to be the last episode of the show, and for a show all about love and finding happy- No, they didn't. They- explicitly told Rebecca Sugar that if she was going to have a same-sex wedding in the show, then she was not getting renewed for another season. That is what happened. And now every year, during Pride, Cartoon Network trots out their wedding like it was their fucking idea to begin with, and I hate it. <laughs> happiness and purpose in life, that's actually a really cool idea. It wouldn't fix the sidelining Ruby, Sapphire, and Garnet all had throughout the show, but it'd be a pretty neat denouement. Allegedly, and I say allegedly because I honestly just don't believe a single word that comes out of Becky's mouth, she had to really fight to get a few more episodes to finish the story. But the- So do you not believe her about the homophobia either then? I mean, you're just, you're just glossing right over that part? You know, where- where Becky Sucrose was told that her show is over if she has a gay wedding between two little lesbians. It, you just, you just not even gonna mention that? You just gonna say, oh, Cartoon Network wanted to end on their wedding and it would have been really happy and cute, but then she begged for more episodes and ruined everything because I hate Rebecca Sugar for some inexplicable reason. <laughs> I hate this woman I've never met. I don't know. What's another, did she, did she, uh... She leave a flaming bag of poop on your front porch. Did she uh did she fill your car with packing peanuts? What did Rebecca Sugar do to you, Lily? <laughs> The solution there could have just been to flip them around. Have the wedding after the end of the show, after all that shit with the diamonds. They couldn't. Because in order to make sure that the wedding couldn't be cut, they put it in the same episode as the diamonds arriving. So then, because it was plot relevant, Cartoon Network couldn't skip it. That is why. Did you do any research? These negotiations presumably took place in 2018. It was possible. And if you- Presumably. I don't believe anything Rebecca Sugar says because... Raisins. <laughs> you have no reason to not believe- Like, Rebecca Sugar doesn't have a track record of lying. She's had no scandals as much as you probably really wish she did. Y like, the worst thing people can always come up with is she drew Ed, Ed, and Eddie porn when she was a teenager. Ooh. You know, who the fuck cares? Oh my god, who the hell cares? Anyway. <laughs> I did it well. It'd be beautiful because you're having the wedding after healing the crystal gems. That yeah, you're fucking stupid. Storytelling. You're but fucking stupid. But by the time stupid. you came around to figure most of this stuff out, the show had already backed itself into a corner by clogging itself with way too many episodes about Mayor Dewey. It didn't back itself into a corner. They didn't realize they were not going to get renewed for another season. Now, I do agree that they probably should have planned things out a little better because with any show, you never know if you're going to get renewed for another season. You know, you, you could be cancelled at any time, so you try to at least have a plot that can resolve within a season, you know? Uh, the Boys was doing that for a while, and unfortunately, as soon as they knew they had a second season coming, the writing quality went down. Because <laughs> uh, they, they started holding off plot lines for next time, and you could really, really tell us what they were doing. Still a good show, though. Still a great show, but uh, it, season three, the writing was a little bit more meh. So, but even so, I mean, they, they wanted the gay wedding, 
They were gonna lose the whole show for doing it. That's why it is the way it is. Love it or hate it. Uh, you know. Lars, Sadie, and Ronaldo. And at the end of the day, any show has to end at some point. Cartoon Network was never going to let this show keep limping along forever, and that's not even a limping problem unique along. to Steven Universe. Multiple shows have hamstrung them. I don't know, somehow Steven Universe survived being at a 6.30 fucking time slot where it was obviously put to die. <laughs> so I say it did a pretty good job. <laughs> by just twiddling their thumbs with a looming deadline on the horizon. Perception is what makes this difficult to explain, because Steven Universe on the surface looks like a slow burn with a rushed ending, but the rushed ending is just the consequences. Time you waste on garbage now is time you won't have on important things later. Even good cartoons get three or four seasons at most. Look, I'm sorry, but you're not One Piece. You're not gonna get 500 episodes to start the process, to begin the preliminary evaluation, to decide if you're eligible I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone expects to be One Piece. The reason why the One Piece anime is so long is because the manga is so long, and the reason why the manga is so long is because it is literally the best-selling book ever in Japanese history. I'm not even kidding. Look it up. <laughs> That's why One Piece is the way it is. I don't think anyone goes into making a television show in the West thinking they're gonna be One Piece. I'm just, I'm just... Putting it out there. Oh god, Jay is going feral in the chat because One Piece was mentioned. <laughs> eligible for permission to embark on the first leg of your journey, and Steven Universe was already long as sin. It had 180 episodes. You know how many episodes All in the Family had? 205. And that's the most beloved sitcom in the fucking world. Revolution- That's a sitcom, bro. Sitcoms are, are, are constructed to keep people coming back to a particular time slot every night. That's why they're so goddamn long. Ugh. You just do not understand how television networks work, do you, Lily? <laughs> Girl Utena, the show Becky Cribs most of her ideas from, had 40 episodes. Yes, and like I explained earlier, anime either has 12, 26, 40 episodes or goes on indefinitely like fucking One Piece. <laughs> Am I ahead of you or are you ahead of me, Lily? <laughs> and it managed to tell a coherent st It managed to tell a complete story. It managed. <laughs> okay. Okay. I will give you that. That was funny. <laughs> to actually end in a way that was satisf- It actually managed to end! Okay, no, no, you're, you're fucking- you're fucking milking the joke now, I take it back. I take it back. The one praise, taking it back. The fuck is this? Is this your- That's like half of what show usually Is this your- your channel mascot? What is going on? Well, Bonnie, congratulations on figuring out your division. Thank you. And to answer your question, every on? episode still has a complete three-act structure, so their runtime is irrelevant. Oh, I see. Carry on. There we go. The Lack fuck was that? The show's big problem. Wherever the crew is writing a story, they're getting distracted with random vignettes, anime reference. You're talking about random vignettes? What the fuck was that you just did? What was that? What did they have to do with anything? <laughs> what did he do? That was like literally out of nowhere. <laughs> Says and trying to cram. Uh, I'm something of a writer myself, says Lily Orker. <laughs> And Becky's latest musical number into it somewhere like a Monty Oem fight. It's clear, on an executive level at least, that one- For the record, I do intend to take this section of the stream and edit it down into a video at some point for everyone to enjoy if they would like to. So, just throwing that out there. <laughs> one or both of the showrunners saw this as their magnum opus, and thus needed to cram everything into it they possibly could. Any idea they might have had that could serve as its own single season spin-off or miniseries was just thrown into Steven Universe's- <laughs> what are you- Are you saying there were, like, backdoor pilots all over Steven Universe? Arguably, you could say Lars of the Stars was a- was a bit of a backdoor pilot, but that's the only one. And it's only because, uh, Rebecca Sugar and crew really, really like Lars for some fucking reason that will never, ever make sense to me. <laughs> As an aside, most of the criticism towards Steven Universe often gets deflected by blaming Cartoon Network, and I think that belies the real issue. On some level, Becky was con- we blame Cartoon Network for the things that were their fault, and, and you just ignore that, because you said, like, the creators should have planned the show around how the network ended up airing the episodes after they were given them, which the creators have absolutely no fucking control over. 
convinced this was the only chance she would get. Despite having worked in the industry for some time, even working with superstar producers like Gendy Tartakovsky. So not only was every idea shoved in there, everything was compromised to such an absurd degree. Ironically, it was Steven Universe that gave me a brand new appreciation for Lauren Faust, who for a while became rather notorious for bailing on projects after creative differences with the executives. And I respect that. I respect just going, you don't want me to make the show I wanted to make, then I won't make the show. But honestly, I don't think creative freedom would have solved anything because just on a fundamental level, the way she writes and thinks is flawed. And this is the other thing, just Lily Orchid thinking Rebecca Sugar wrote the entire show, just every episode was written by her apparently. And her alone as well, just just her. Just just Rebecca Sugar right in every single fucking episode because that's that's how television shows work. <laughs> you like honestly like Lily th seems to think like this shit works like a webcomic or something. It's very strange. The answer to any lore question about Steven Universe is it depends. Why? Because the what? answer changes every week. Are fusions composite identities, or are they their own identities greater than the sum of their parts? It depends. They are one where they need to be, and the other at all- They're both. They're both! Why can't you understand this? This is how I view fusion, by the way. Since we're, we get to have my superior opinions to contrast these. Fusion, in my mind, is like- Multiple people all sharing the same perspective as long as they're within that fusion and in sync. So, they have all been that singular person and they all are those sing those individual people. But they've all had that same experience of being that one person. And that makes sense to me. Maybe that's too much of a complex idea uh, for you. Maybe you want to go back to My Little Pony. <laughs> Lily, that might be more your speed. At all other times, and there is no consistency. Is fusion a metaphor for relationships, intimacy, sex, friendship, symbiosis, combat team up? It's for- it's- it's all of those as well. It's relationships, which would include friendship, which would include familial relationships, which would include romantic relationships and sexual relationships. So, relationships in general. All the kinds. It's- it's not that difficult. I will say, though, the crew didn't do themselves any favors with the early fusions. Because all the first fusions we see, the Crystal Gems are doing very suggestive dances. So, I don't blame anyone who thinks fusion is sex for that reason. They really fucking kind of shot themselves in the foot. What, Skrell? <laughs> what? <laughs> you guys say something that annoys me, aren't you? <laughs> the sinister Dr. Sugar. Yeah. Check my Discord. Uh-oh. What have you done? Sorry, I had it full screen. <laughs> okay, this is going on screen right now. <laughs> you know, I'm something of a writer myself. <laughs> Look, Lily, it's your fursona! <laughs> oh my god! I'm so happy for you. The concept that mashing characters together is cool? Tax evasion? The answer is yes. Now, fusion as a concept is not unique. It was found in anime for years, and the style that Steven Universe uses is taken from both Dragon Ball Z and Kingdom Hearts. But in those, it's not really- Why are you talking about Kingdom Hearts again? Why? Did you just play 3 recently or something? emblematic of anything other than the power of friendship taken to its logical extreme. In Steven Universe, because Becky's kind of pretentious, fusion is a... well, it's not a metaphor, it's a oh, no, simile. Wrong layer. A metaphor is something, a simile is like something. D mm. No, a simile are two words that mean the same concept. I think And metaphors are not one-to-one -one comparisons. That would be an analogy. An analogy is a one-to-one -one comparison. A metaphor is is more abstract. Is a more abstract representation of another idea. So you don't understand writing at all, do you? But you you, you talk about it with such confidence, and and you know you are also something of a writer yourself. <laughs> I'm gonna have to keep it- I'm gonna have to keep it not full screen so I can keep flipping back to that when I need it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, actually, let's look up just, 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 just to see if I'm not talking out of my ass. Let's look up the the definition of a metaphor. A metaphor is a figure of speech in a word or phrase that is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. Uh, so let's see examples of metaphors. Actually, examples of a metaphor. Um, he is a lion when he comes to the field. Uh, my mom has a heart of gold. Yeah, that's a metaphor. So it's not really quite a one-to-one -one comparison of two things. That's more of an analogy, uh, I think. Blind as a bat. Yeah. Busy bee. Um. I guess metaphors and analogies are pretty similar, but I know a simile isn't what Lily is saying it means. Uh. Oh, okay. Never mind. Maybe it kind of is. Brave as a lion, crazy like a fox. You know, what the fuck is the difference between analogies, similes, and metaphors, exactly? Because they all sound like the same shit, don't they? <laughs> Maybe that's the point. They all represent each other. Oh, my mind is blown right now. Anyway. <laughs> it's basically unity and working in sync. There's a lot of ways to do that, and admittedly, despite insistence from the fandom otherwise, the show has never really pretended that isn't the case. You've got the very intimate kind of fusion with Garnet, but then you have Steven and Amethyst bro-fisting to fight bad guys. Yeah. Any idea that it's strictly about intimacy or relationships is thrown out the window when Jasper fuses with a complete stranger and a beast. Well, yeah, and that's obviously not a very good relationship. The, the the only reason that worked is because the other gem wanted to escape, you know? So they both wanted something from this. Jasper wanted power. Ocean Jasper wanted to escape. They were able to fuse, but then the fusion falls apart, like, almost immediately. Because, you know, it didn't work very well. What I want to know is how the fuck Lapis knew how to trap someone in a fusion, and that never comes up again, because that's a very interesting concept. Fusions are presumed to not last if the people involved aren't in sync, but Lapis exactly! at the bottom of the ocean for months tormenting her for giggles. Then in the very- Well, yeah, but also, we don't know how the fuck she knew how to do that. Exactly. This is what I was saying, though. It's interesting that she was able to do that at all, you know? But... In the last episode, Steven is just fusing with gems that aren't even active, which are- they're his family members, though. A, they're his family members. B, they wanted to get all these fusions in before the ending, and I can't really blame them for that, so I tolerate it. it so what? It's a fun little scene. Who the fuck cares? Sometimes things can just be fun, Lily. Do you understand fun? I don't think you do. Jonas Lee, are you allowed to do that? That feels like it should be a crime. The truth of the matter is that showing off new- Fusion isn't sex, Lily! <laughs> Fusions is eye-grabbing, but building up to them consistently is difficult, so they just don't bother. Any notion of fusion having some kind of meaning is abandoned by the writers pretty damn fast. But you know what? That's fine, because that was a problem that they already solved. Fusion is given its intimate weight through permafusion. Garnet and later Rodonite are permanently fused because they are in love. Because of this, they're actually very in sync. Okay, I want to point out something because this annoys me. Permafusion is not a term from the show. It's not a term that's ever been used in the show. It's not a term the crew has ever used. It's a term that fans use. So does it mean, like, permafusion is a big theme because it's just a name some fans have given to a thing in the show. So that doesn't even mean that's, like, the intent to be focused on at all. It, so you gotta not confuse fanon with canon. Also, I like Sunstone. I would like Sunstone better if they didn't have the, the, the atrophied little sapphire arms. I kind of hate that. I hate that a lot, actually. <laughs> Otherwise, great, great design. <laughs> I don't like a lot of the fusion designs, to be honest. <laughs> because they're accustomed to being fused all the time, and they don't like not being fused because they've been together so long that being apart creates a very deafening solitude. A lot of people might hate the idea of sharing a mind with someone, but to someone who has already been sharing a mind for a very long time, being a complete individual could be just as nightmarish. This isn't a new concept. In Star Trek, most Borg drones who become separated from the- I mean, I want to call it nightmarish, because Ruby and Sapphire- split apart easily in future and are comfortable with it and are fine you know and it doesn't like torture them to be apart they're not like in pain uh, <laughs> the collective are very distressed when it happens and they're they not like borg the and permafusion is that but like not evil to the writer's credit permafusion isn't something they pull out lightly 
There's only six permafusions in the entire show, and only two of them have significant speaking roles, so it's not like they're throwing permafusions out like Pokemon cards. The one we spend the most time with is Garnet, and we learn very it quickly how much actual weight she puts permafusion like it's an actual fusion. term in the show. When her to form Sardonyx without her informed consent, real actual thing she did by the way, she's enraged. When she discovered the artificial fusions Homeworld was creating, she's horrified to the point of tears. When Paradox explains what the cluster is, Garnet actively calls it an abomination. This is usually the part where I tell you how they fuck it up, but no. Oh, this is one of the few- Well, the cluster's not just an abomination because of, like, you know, forced fusion. It's an abomination because it's a bunch of pieces of people's dead bodies all glued together. That's kind of horrific when you think about it. <laughs> two things they remain consistent on. They remain so consistent on it, in fact, that they actually use it to interesting effect. See, because Garnet is the only adult in Stephen's life who isn't fucking crazy, she becomes his model for good relationships. Which it's very arguable. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, ever determined to take the shortest route to any destination possible, proposes to Connie and says that they should be Stevani permanently. This is disturbing to Connie. Did you just say it was like Steven's habit of trying to like leap to things as much? No. Ugh! Like I just said earlier, the whole point of Future is Steven going around to everyone he knows, trying what works for them because he's desperate for meaning in his own life, and it doesn't work because he's just trying to emulate other people instead of, like, finding out what he really wants. That's why this goes downhill very quickly for him. But that's also why he's rushing into, like, proposing to Connie because he's fucking desperate. He doesn't know what to do with himself anymore. He's 16 and he saved the entire galaxy. Where do you go from there? who has lived with actual real parents and friends and so places a lot of value on individuality, so she obviously turns him down. They're also children, so legally they can't marry and morally they shouldn't. It shows, probably for the first time, that other people have experiences that are different from Steven, and the things he's been taught to value are not the things they've been taught to value. Future is the only- What?! That's not what this scene is about at all! <laughs> just cannot follow anything like god maybe because you get like all your narrative plot expectations from fucking kingdom hearts i don't know what the hell the only time steven's role as moral center of the show is scrubbed away and he has to confront the he's not the moral center of the show oh <laughs> 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 the fact that people will say no to him and he's just gonna have to live with that there's also a ptsd No is a no. That is God. You just do not even fucking understand what future is about, do you? <laughs> Plot, but it sucks. So yeah, permafusion uh -huh. and the weight and implications behind it are actually really well done, and Gruniver sticks to it. Unfortunately, that solid foundation turns out to be a cockroach in the coffee maker when we get to the Sardonyx arc. In the Sardonyx arc, Pearl and Garnet form Sardonyx to destroy Peridot's beacon to homeworld with more grace and agility than Sugalai previously had. But then Pearl starts repairing it to have an excuse to fuse more often. No idea why it didn't occur to her to just ask, but then again, you can set your watch to Pearl being completely fucking irrational. She gets caught, and Garnet is rightly furious, leading to an episode where Ruby and Sapphire can't agree on what to do about it. This is all interesting character work so far, as we now have to contrast the fact that Sapphire uses her precognition to avoid addressing issues in the here and now, and Ruby can't see the future so she thinks Sapphire doesn't care. When they get home, all Garnet says is, not now. This is good because it puts the arc uh -huh. to bed in a way where we can pick it back up whenever we like and deal with it when everyone involved has clearer heads. We could do that, but you remember how Pearl and Pink Pearl had to have a rapid fire therapy session inside the Mind Break clam? And all it really did was emphasize how averse to quiet moments Kruniverse is? Well, Pearl and Garnet get stuck in a trash compactor and have to very quickly work out their shit and fuse before they can get out. Furthermore, this confrontation is largely Pearl just asking for forgiveness and then making excuses about how- Almost like it's a metaphor for this being a conversation they can no longer avoid and have to actually talk about. You know, almost like all the gem stuff in the show is fucking metaphorical. And you're taking it way too literally. And you don't understand metaphors. Uh, she couldn't help herself, which is something a rapist would say in court. Pearl wanted to fuse with Garnet- Jesus fucking Christ! Because Garnet's so strong and put together and stoic and independent and she wanted to be strong too. But Garnet says, hey, uh, this idea that I'm some stoic, strong, always together person who doesn't need emotional support is a load of horse shit. This is one of the first times Garnet has admitted to having doubts and insecurities outside of being the stoic one. So, when do we get to see more of- Pool hopping? Pool hopping is when we get to see more of that? This side of her Becky. Pool hopping? Pool hopping. Go fucking rewatch it. <laughs>
Good job. It's unfortunately also soured by the fact that Garnet is now consoling the person who assaulted her. Why? Why is she doing this? Why are Only you are choosing to read it as assault, you dipshit. And from some things I've heard about you, Lily, you shouldn't be throwing stones in glass houses. <laughs> Pearl's feelings being given more weight than the person she hurt. Well, unfortunately, this is how a lot of stories treat black women, especially in relation to their white- WHAT?! Where did that come from?! Okay, I guess now we've gotten to the part that's as unhinged as I expected it to be, it was only 35 minutes in. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's hear this out. I guess. Hopefully, I won't pause and scream again immediately. Wait, co-leads. Garnet's feelings aren't prioritized because the writers overwhelmingly favor Pearl, and this is a story where Pearl is undeniably, unequivocally in the wrong, and as we've explored, Cruniverse is just unwilling to stick to that. Also, due to the fact that the show doesn't really want. The show makes no bones about Pearl being in the wrong. And then they talk about it like adults, and they make up. And they only talk about it when they have no choice but to talk about it, but they finally talk about it like adults, and come to a reconciliation like adults. Some people don't hold grudges forever, Lily. Even when Rebecca Sugar... I don't know, what did she do this time? Toilet papered your house, I don't know. <laughs> to explore any kind of conflict resolution other than forgiveness, which naturally puts the responsibility for ending a conflict on the victim over the- How dare people choose to forgive and, and, and reconcile their differences and reconcile mistakes with each other and continue their relationships? How dare they? How dare they do that? Pearl- I don't think Pearl's coded anything, but it is funny that people always read Pearl as white when her- when her voice actor is Filipino. <laughs> The perpetrator, but the problems with that are magnified when your dainty white ballerina violently assaults a black woman and all she has to say for herself is, I couldn't help it, you're just so strong and alluring. Um, Lily? I think this might be your own racism showing, because I don't think that's what the show is saying at all. You maybe, uh, maybe you want to give your therapist another call and, uh, and unpack that? You might, you might just, uh... Just, uh, just some friendly advice. <laughs> it's not good enough to have characters of color in your show if you're going to so thoroughly torment them like this. And that's what happened to Garnet. They had a few good ideas and then threw her aside only to drag her out to either give exposition about fusion, violate her, or perv on her. So the one time they really had to think- Perv- like the one shot from Love Letters that's supposed to be Jamie's point of view of seeing- of seeing Garnet rise from the ocean like a- like a goddess. That's supposed to be evidence that the show was always perving on Garnet, is it? The one that was supposed to be from the shot of the dude who, like, was instantly smitten with her? Cause it's a- like a cliche kind of thing that lots of shows and movies do cause it's visual shorthand. And you just really want to make this about racism somehow, don't you? Um... Oh, but see, Lily Orchid's like 124th Cherokee or something, so, so, you know, that means not white somehow, <laughs> apparently. So, you know, you can say things like this, I guess. <laughs> Think about the weight they put on permafusion, and they are ultimately sabotaged by their own primary theme, and their unwillingness to let Pearl be in the wrong without caveats, and their own racism. And I'm not gonna soften that one. The shit they pulled- Uh, Lily, that was not their own racism, that was your own racism coming out all by itself, unprovoked. You are the one putting this idea onto what you are seeing. Uh, get help, please. Stop it. Get some help. We're gonna have to bring Michael Jordan out here to tell you. <laughs> Garnet in this show, from violating her for the drama, to waving her around like a pinup, to just not letting her have character depth, is morally, ethically, spiritually- Waving her around as a pinup? What, what, what shot did you use for that? Oh, nothing. Nothing. You had no other shots of her looking sexy, apparently, because I guess that's a thing that happens all the time, but you just couldn't find a second shot of it, huh, Lily? <laughs> weight they put on permafusion, and they are ultimately sabotaged- There is no weight put on permafusion! Permafusion isn't even a- Phrase in the show, it's just a fan phrase. Jesus Christ, stop taking fan perspectives and acting like they're canon. 
by their own primary theme and their unwillingness to let Pearl be in the wrong without caveats and their own racism. And I'm not gonna soften that one. The shit they pull with Garnet in this show, from violating her for the drama to waving her around like a pinup to just not letting her have character. Okay, death. no, I'm sorry. He cut. Uh, she said to whatever. Cut to the same shot of uh, from the same scene of Jamie simping for Garnet. And having the cliche, you know, man sees woman walk into a room and she looks like super hot and it's in slow-mo and soft lighting and there's sparkles everywhere and, 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 you know, <laughs> that kind of shit. You know, like every single fucking thing ever does. <laughs> is morally, ethically, spiritually, physically, positively, absolutely, undeniably, and reliably racist. It's not the only instance of Steven Universe being racist, but it's the only one I'm going to cover- Alright, Sugalite's just face is racist, according to some woke skulls. So, yeah. You know, if you're, if you're just trying to find racism and everything, and, and the way you do that is by, like, claiming that- that this- this whole thing about Pearl being- being codependent is about a white woman assaulting a black woman because she's just too hot to resist. You are the one who decided to say that, Lily. You and nobody else. Nobody else in the entire fucking world said that but you. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to call that a bit undeniably racist. <laughs> I just, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing my, uh, my, f my friends of melanin in the chat who are, who are quite upset about this as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. The, the worst thing about Sugalite is that she's voiced by Nicki Minaj, and then they could never get her back again, and so she just never had a fucking voice again. It was a mistake to make the Fusion Celebrity Guest Stars. I will- that is my criticism. <laughs> for this video. This is what I mean when I say that full creative freedom won't make a better show because the fundamentals of how to work with symbolism and just how to resolve some pretty cut and dry conflicts are things that Crooniverse has- <laughs> This is the person who can't even understand simple metaphors. Simple and very obvious metaphors in a children's show. <laughs> ah, these raiders are sure bad at symbolism. I should know because I'm something of a raider myself. I can't t pick a voice to do for Lily. I was supposed to be doing Ben Shabibo and then I keep forgetting to. <laughs> consistently struggled with. The diamonds are the worst for this. The Great Diamond Authority is supposed to be some dysfunctional family. Controlling mom, golden child, other siblings, tantrum throwing out of control child, everything breaks apart, yada yada, your Tamagotchi is sad. But the diamonds are also the cosmic dictators of an intergalactic fashion- So you were- you were calling- you were calling Pearl Chatel slavery earlier. But then you're willing to joke that, oh, she's Pink's Tamagotchi? Really now, huh? Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting right after that, that stupendous amount of showing how racist you are by trying to claim something else is racist. <laughs> <laughs> empire that spans most of the galaxy and whose victims are numerous enough that they're incubating in the Earth's core in a lethal combination of mass grave and weapons of mass destruction. You know, I feel like these two aspects of the diamonds are not really going to gel together. This is one of those instances where you have a good foundation for an interesting story. I mean, my parents are in space and I'm a strange- I mean, that's almost like all the gem stuff works on a metaphorical level. You know, that thing you don't understand from them isn't a bad one. The progress of Steven learning that Rose wasn't stuck there but hit of her own volition would be interesting. But for some unknown reason, the stakes are artificially inflated so fucking high. So it's not just my parents are in space and I'm estranged from them, it's my parents are in space and I'm estranged from them and that estrangement has a body count in the trillions, also Earth will blow up if we don't make up and become a family. So the thing about estranged family is you're not really required to be- Well, no, they didn't have to make up and become a family for the Earth not to blow up. They, they solved the cluster issue by themselves without the diamonds if, if you recall you know the show you're supposed to be reviewing um you seem to like just only remember like single episodes and don't remember them in context at all <laughs> become unestranged you can just stay estranged at time of making the old video i was a rose did stay estranged this is steven they're two different people it's almost like that's the point of the ending <laughs> Estranged from all of my immediate relatives, and at the time of making this one, I- Oh, you're estranged from all of your immediate rel relatives? I wonder why, Lily. I mean, being estranged from a few relatives is one thing, but all of them? Sounds like maybe you might be the problem, and, you know, after seeing some of your takes in this video, I, uh, well... You know. <laughs> I'm tentatively on sociable terms with three of them, and the fourth I would like to forget ever existed, but I did that at my own pace. Crooniverse Hello, really thank you doesn't for the, like thank you the for idea the of disowning family and making a new one, so the story is filled with 17 different-
They don't like the idea of disowning family and making a new one? That is literally what both Rose and Greg did. Both of them. That their child decided to reunite with family is his own decision. It's a decision any child should be able to have, no matter what their parents' relationship is with certain family members. You're just- you're just fucking- are you the one huffing paint this time? Like you always accuse fucking Rebecca Sugar of doing? You know? You huffing Freon over there? What are you- what are you doing? different traps so that Pink Diamond pretty much has no choice but to make nice with her controlling family, and actively refusing to do so is routinely characterized- He's not Pink Diamond! That is the- he's not his mom! That is the point! Oh my god! It's a selfish decision, because that's what happens when you give family drama a body count. Understandably, most people don't like this story because it's- gross. It's astounding just how much has to be taken out of the character's hands, and how high the stakes have to be, and how much the story has to railroad itself entirely because not reuniting with the rest of the diamonds is just instantly, the moment you even think about it, the rational, correct, and healthy decision to make. It's like all those shows that try to make civil rights groups into villains, including Steven Universe itself, funnily enough, and they have to do so much work to make you not- At one point, were the Crystal Gems villains? Or you're saying Bismuth. Bismuth wasn't even a villain. It just, it just shows the repeat of what she went through with Rose, basically. Also, she was also a celebrity guest star, so they had to take her out of the story for a bit, okay? Sometimes, sometimes things just happen for better reasons, alright? You have to deal with it. What's the Outside ratio for the video? You... Let's see. 5k up dudes, 1.2k down dudes. So, uh, there you go. <laughs> Bismuth want to do? Kill three dictators and liberate Homeworld. You wouldn't know that if you talked to the fanbase. The fanbase seems convinced she was a blood knight who wanted to murder all homeworld gems. But I've gone over Bismuth's episode with the fuck. So you missed the part where she said we're gonna- we'll go after the upper crusts next? Did you miss that part? Where she- she- she was talking like she was willing to- to kill ordinary aristocratic gems and not just the diamonds? Did you- did you fucking miss that part? When she's talking about the upper crusts, because that's who she means. She means the aristocratic. She means like the sapphires and the, the lapises and the, the jades and shit, man. <laughs> she's a blue collar gem. Fine tooth comb, and the fan base just fucking made that up. Furthermore, the show ties all of its metaphysics. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. She just wants to murder a child. That's all. <laughs> In Bismuth's defense, she probably. Well, no, she would understand what humans are, because she was a crystal gem. So yeah, she probably did know that was going to fucking kill him. <laughs> into the diamonds. Without the Dark. diamonds, they can't make new gems, they can't fix old gems, and the gems are doomed to erode out of existence. I'm gonna coin a new term and call this coercive world building. Any reason- Coercive world building? Is that like when the story doesn't go the way you want it to? Hang on a sec, I gotta pause. This coercive- When story- oh, he's probably gonna like say it, but when storytelling decisions are made entirely just by previous story decisions that are being questioned by the audience. God. Again, this attitude that, like, do you know how long it takes for an animated season of television to be made? Like, you know how the movie came out in 2019? You know how the movie came out in 2019? It was greenlit in 2015 because the turnaround on an episode, just an episode, just one episode of animation, the turnaround is a year. So, you're trying to say that they're writing around questions from the audience, like, a year before those questions were made, or even asked, you know? Because usually, say when season three is airing, the writing for season four is already locked in, and they're starting to animate episodes. But you just want to, like, so, oh, God, oh, God, my head. I am going to have an aneurysm. This is, this is like, the most brain-dead thing I've ever heard. <laughs> world building. Any reasonable person would go, this bitch fascist, and kick White Diamond out of a fucking window. And in response- You mean that's what you think, but you know, some of us actually pay attention to the fucking story and what is being communicated to us. <laughs> Unlike you, who apparently you just- apparently when you watch television shows, Lily, you just sit there hallucinating the show you wish you were watching, and then when that doesn't happen, you get mad. Which, you know, maybe- maybe lay off the Freon. <laughs> 
And Specky goes, uh, 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 well, uh, um, you can't because, uh, uh, the goop that G makes the gems comes from the diamonds and, and, and. And that was clear from, like, as early as the first episode where they saw the kindergarten. And what episode was that? It was on the run, right? I was looking up simile earlier, wasn't I? Steven Universe on the run. Um... 40th episode of the first season. And I'm pretty sure this is the one where they go to the kindergarten. Yep. So the first time we see Injectors is in season one. So clearly there must be something in those Injectors that creates gems. Right? And we know each diamond has their own court with gems that, you know are roughly the same colors as them, or all the gems we see can be combinations of any of the diamonds. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear from inference, pretty early on, that there is something in the injectors that, that is able to make gems. So it's not like this was a last-minute thing they thought of. <laughs> to be fair, we didn't know it was diamond cum, specifically. <laughs> Do you have to call it that? <laughs> I saw one of the creators call it diamond elixirs. I think that's 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 it's nice and uh, not awkward. <laughs> I know Sharkman calls it the uh, diamond gamer girl bathwater. <laughs> diamond pee. Oh god. <laughs> All right, let's let's get off this topic. <laughs> essence. I also say essence. Yeah. Uh, I would expect nothing less from my chat. <laughs> and, uh, also the diamonds are the only ones who can heal the gems. So, 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 so you can't kill them or you'll doom the gems to go extinct. So, like, do better. Now, that's one way to go about fostering reconciliation. I mean, they couldn't go extinct because they're immortal. But, like, uh, assumedly they're not propagating more gems, which you could make that argument. Like, you know, isn't it a bit, isn't it a bit iffy to tell... To tell a race that they can't reproduce anymore? <laughs> that could be a problem. But no, I guess, I guess Lily's not smart enough to talk about that issue, but... ...creation of an estranged family? Another option is to have literally anyone involved actually interested in said reconciliation, but your idea is good too. Because that's the thing, nobody cares. At all. Blue What do you mean nobody cares? What do you mean nobody cares? You can't just... State your own opinions like they're the fucking objective result of watching this show. <laughs> Shinzo Abe would be so proud, god damn it. <laughs> I hate you. I know what meme you're re referring to. <laughs> Diamond is grieving, but she's not doing anything. Yellow is just going to blow up the planet and wash her hands of it. White Diamond is too busy trying to hunt down and exterminate Homeworld's underground jewels. And every version of Pink Diamond looks at the other diamonds with complete and total contempt. Even outside that immediate family, so to speak, the diamonds are completely hated. Even after their redemption, not a single character has a kind thing to say about them. Nobody in the cast wanted this reconciliation, so why did we do this? This isn't even a thematic issue. Making the characters involved invested in the thing you want them to do is like writing 101. We go from Steve- But wait, nobody says nice things about the- I mean, there's- there are gems hanging out with- with- with Blue Diamond and- and her clouds. And White says she's going around to various, you know, former colonies and, and letting letting gems try out her new reversal powers and 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 there, there's gems taking tours of, of the old palace and they all seem pretty chill with the diamonds. I mean and Spinel of course is their new baby that they dote on and what are you talking about? <laughs> Steven going, we're family, we have to be family, and then one episode later it's like, oh, these fucking guys again. He was so invested in this reconciliation, and then he just- I mean, you, you, you just said you're estranged from every single one of your family members, so why aren't you, like, why aren't you vibing with Steven on that one? I, I don't understand here. <laughs> I mean, he, he's not inviting them to Thanksgiving or anything anytime soon, if, you know, come on. Give up, seemingly off screen. Well, we know why. The Diamond's Redemption was the single most contentious thing the show ever did. You spend the no. entire show being told, yep, they're evil, they're oppressive, they do genocide, they hate non-standard relationships, they don't respect people's identities, all the- They don't. 
They're not genocidal. Unless you count against gems, but most people who say that are like, Ah, oh, the diamonds genocided entire planets. I'm like, look, I don't like it either, but word of God is they never, they never met anything that wasn't like above an animal species. So again, environmental message. They're expanding their civilization and destroying ecosystems and wiping out entire other species that are lower than them. I wonder what other species does that. I wonder. Golly gee. I mean, it's almost as obvious as a fucking Captain Planet episode, but somehow people don't get it. <laughs> the people they want to exterminate are branded with stars. And then suddenly the show just fucking 180s and go- The peep- Oh, God. Hang on. That- Oh. Oh, uh, did you just say what I think you fucking just said? Holy shit. To genocide, they hate non-standard relationships, they don't respect people's identities, all the people they want to exterminate are branded with stars, and then- Okay, there is no word stronger- There's no word strong enough than retarded for what Lily just said. That is just fundamentally... Mentally challenged. <laughs> that is brain damage levels of takes. You might as well just be babbling nonsense words and smearing applesauce on the wall. Did you just try to say the crystal gems all wear stars? Because they're being oppressed like the Jews. In a show made by a Jewish woman. Rebecca Sugar said the reason they picked the star as a symbol is because it's kind of gender neutral. So both girls and boys could relate to it and want to wear it. So I think they actually considered making it a heart at some point. Well, she's still a woman. She still says she's a woman. So she is a woman. I mean, uh, oh, you talk about, I thought you were talking about sugar, um, but, uh, ba -da -ba -da. What was, I lost my train of thought! <laughs> but yeah, like, the star also, like, it, especially when you see it on Rose's outfit, it kind of looks like a hibiscus, which is the symbol of pink diamond. Uh... And Peridot was asking if she has to wear a star because she's, like, tentatively a member of the Crystal Gems now. And she's an idiot. That's all. And she has no social skills. <laughs> uh, like, you're trying to stretch. Like, you're just doubling down on the, the Diamonds or Nazis bullshit with this whole their enemies are branded with stars. Just shut the fuck up. Oh my god. Okay, I am getting angrier than the Utana takes now. <laughs> Suddenly the show just fucking 180s and goes OMG like cringe aunties. It's clear at some point redeem the- I love the diamonds in the movie fucking fight me. I love them being a silly little Greek chorus that opens and ends the movie. I love it. It's the best thing that's ever been done with them. Fuck off, Lily. <laughs> The villains was written on a post-it note somewhere, and they just never went back to think about that? If you're going to do that, if you're going to go, this is a show about forgiveness and redemption, then fine. Just dial back the- Nobody ever said that's what the show is about! That's just one of the themes! What's my L take? That the diamonds are great in the movie? Fuck you, they are. They're wonderful. I love them. I love how, like, now that Steven knows them, they're far less intimidating. It's great. <laughs> Just, lo just like I love Jasper being an immature idiot who's ripping up grass in future. It's, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. As Steven gets to know his, en his former enemies, he gets to know them better, and they just become, like, goofy-ass people like everybody else, because they are. <laughs> That's the point. The stakes, you hyperactive weirdo. This is the problem with writing on presumption. Steven Universe came out in the heyday of villain redemptions. <laughs> Damn you, grass! Get off my lawn! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hasn't aged very well, but this isn't a new observation. Villain redemptions were so overused in the 2010s, it's being deconstructed or reconstructed. We're and villains about were just like, Kingdom I'm Hearts take over again! The world because I fucking can. Why are we talking about Kingdom comparison. Hearts what again? You by killing her. If I wanted to kill her, I'd beat her to death with a frozen lamb chop and then eat it with a nice Merlot. 
Agatha Even just on a Christie? fundamental level, if you have multiple villains and you redeem all of them, that's just boring. Steven Universe is only no- You know what that is, Lily? That's fucking Dragon Ball Z. That's fucking Dragon Ball Z. Vegeta killed thousands of people and blew up planets and was a real piece of shit, but he still married Bulma and had kids and became part of the main team because fuck you. Sometimes entertainment can just be entertainment. It doesn't have to be life lessons it's teaching you. Jesus Christ. Grow up. <laughs> Notable because villain redemptions always had that one line they would never cross, usually by just not including them. But Steven Universe did it. They jumped that line and they never lived it down, so I don't feel compelled to rub the show's nose in it any further. Even fans, blind idiot stands notwithstanding, will say this story completely fucking sucked. So the discussion is pretty much- What was that? Was that Vox? What was that? I don't know what it's supposed to be. Like, I mean, I have my problems with Vox sometimes, but, you know, if, if it's me uh, and him against Lily, Vox is my bestie. <laughs> I was even at Krillin's- I was even at Krillin's barbecue nights and movie nights! Listen to me, Kakarot, I'm using his fucking name! God damn it, I love the boo bits. <laughs> over and no amount of defensive entries on TV tropes come. You'll no you no you notice my Jasper voice and my Vegeta voice are nearly identical. There's probably a reason for that. <laughs> knowledge segment will change that. All over the show, on a thematic level, you see the same problem that affects the plot and characters. Most of their ideas suffer from distractions and the ramping up of stakes for absolutely no reason, and the fact that they don't think about how these stories should conclude and brute force them to all conclude the same way. There's a good way to do the sardonyx do arc, but for the good of everyone involved, it requires removing the part where Pearl violates someone's bodily autonomy. Maybe re No! It was fine the way it is, and it's a good storyline, and you're the idiot who was over here saying it's racist because I want it to be. <laughs> like, you dislocated your shoulder with that reach and just showed how you're fucking racist. Jesus Christ. Replace <laughs> it with... Oh, and I'm just spitballing here. A quiet conversation where characters are emotionally vulnerable with each other as they talk about insecurities and weaknesses. They did have that. They had that, but while they were almost being crushed by a thing, because it was symbolic of the pressure they were feeling to talk about it. You know, and almost like quiet talking scenes or something you don't usually have in a kid's show, because it is, again, for children. This show is for, like, eight years old and up, pal. You know, you gotta, you know, kids do watch things. I know as a, as a childless middle-aged person, as I myself am, it is hard to remember that, yes, things for children are, in fact, made for children, but you, got, you, gotta, you gotta accept that sometimes and appreciate, you know, how the writing limitations adults working on these things have. I, I don't get your problem with Sardonyx arc. It's just Pearl's codependent and, and you know, she, did, she fucked up really bad because people do, and they hashed it out in the end. You know, just like real fucking life. Except for you, I guess you just you just you just block every family member who pisses you off once. Probably that's why you're strained from ev literally everyone, <laughs> everyone you've ever known. It's like yeah, everyone I've ever known hates me. It's their fault. Must be them. Can't be me. <laughs> Maybe this is why you hate the lessons of the show, Lily, where people have to actually you know own up to their mistakes and be accountable for them and apologize for their shitty behavior and change their ways. I wonder why a story like that gets under your skin. <laughs> and strength. You know, the part where Steven Universe really shines and don't get interrupted by a death trap. Ironically, the best episodes of this show are either when characters are just sitting and talking or the ones that are just this high concept mood piece. It works when it's being two and a half gems or tree of life, but when it's trying to be this genre smorgasbord of bad anime from the 80s, that's when it falls over. So many of the show's strangest moments seem like they were made entirely to be more like Utena, but ironically, they forget the one thing that made Utena worth watching. At least It's nothing like Utena, it's just some visual references. Oh my god! It's not even trying to be the same themes. Utena's actually really depressing when you get down to it. At least once in spite of the drugged up nonsense. For those who haven't seen it, and I'm giving you the very basic version here, Utena is a story about a girl getting wrapped in- Why are we talking about Utena again? Like less than half this video is actually about Steven Universe. Oh god, I'm gonna scream if there's another bad Utana take. Are you gonna say this is racist too, probably, somehow?
I mean, I know, like, Anthe is, she looks Indian, and she's, like, the only dark-skinned person in the entire show, but I don't think that's, I think that's just the Japanese not having the same uh, cultural hang-ups Americans do, and we really need to stop projecting our shit onto them. <clears throat> ...into a dueling tournament where the prize is an actual human person being sold off like cattle. And when she discovers that this girl is basically a slave, resolves to win specifically to free her. She wasn't even in the competition to win this girl, she just wanted to fight. But ultimately she fails, and Anthe has to be the one to free herself by actually wanting to believe that things could be better. And in the end, she walks away and goes to find her maybe dead, maybe missing fiancé. The thing is, the undercurrent the show comes to a head in the penultimate episode. So you did understand the ending. So you did understand the ending, but then you said it was open-ended and vague and ambiguous. Make up- you just, you just contradicted yourself in the same fucking video. I have it on film. I have me yelling at you. Oh, uh, what did you send me now, Skrill? <laughs> Am I out of touch? No, it's my family who is wrong. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if you're estranged from every single family member, it's a bit of a red flag. I just, uh, it's throwing it out there. I mean, it's not impossible for, like, a good person to have, like, just a completely shitty family, like Pink Diamond, I guess, but... <laughs> uh, most of the time in real life, there's two sides to every story. <laughs> where Utena professes she's going to win Anthe so nobody can hurt her, but Anthe has heard this line before. This is still ultimately someone trying to control her, however well-meaning they may be, and she is likely setting herself up for more abuse. Conc well, also, she in the, ultimately, she always answers to Akio, no matter who her f current fiancé is. Akio just needs someone who has won Anthe to be able to open the palace in the sky where miracles are. That's what the whole duel thing is about. Akio is the mastermind. Akio is Anthe's older brother, and Akio has a very, very inappropriate relationship with her because he is the fallen prince. He is, um, he is childhood idealism turned into the worst kind of adult, uh, and that is the point. <laughs> Including that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't, she stabs Utena in the back. Literally. Utena got it into her head that she could beat the villain at their own game, and- like, Lily hasn't even mentioned Akio at this point. Like, kind of an important character. He's literally- he literally compares himself to Lucifer as in the star. But, you know, you get the implication there. Uh, he is the devil. <laughs> like, literally. There's no ambiguity about that. <laughs> and it ultimately got her killed because it eroded the trust Anthe had in her. Utena might have had good intentions, but Anthe doesn't know that. This is not- Utena die here, though. Utena gets her ass up and goes and saves Anthe from her unfair fate that Akio has put her in. Um, and then... Utena gets Anthe out of her coffin, and that is what allows Anthe to finally live as herself. It's- it's- Again, obvious metaphors sailing directly over your head, Lily. <laughs> not a system designed for benevolence. It's meant for power. And the victims of that system will not believe you when you say you're going to be benevolent with it. It's only when Utena approaches Anthe as an equal and a companion that Anthe's hope for something better returns to her. This is actually a very basic through line for a lot of- Again, uh, Anth like, Utena is, is, is literally pulling Anthe out of her own coffin that she's been suffering in this entire time. Uh, in reaching Anthe's true self, she's the first one to actually see her, you know, uh, see her for herself. That, that's the whole point of the scene. Utena is the first one to, like, break through Anthe's barriers and see the true her. And then Anthe is able to basically, like, resurrect and be able to live her own life. That is that is the entire point of this scene. You're not even mentioning the coffin part. Like, that's very important. The whole... The whole, we are our own coffins, and the world's our coffin, blah blah blah, is a very, very common theme in Utena. It's a very strange show. Go watch it, though. It's all on YouTube, subbed, actually. You can find the entire playlist on YouTube, subbed for free, because I'm pretty sure 
it's just in licensing hell right now because I can't find the movie anywhere. I have it on DVD, but it, like it's nowhere to stream or anything. <laughs> Out of thematic and socio-political issues, this is the core fallacy behind, say, police reform. The police, as they exist as a concept, was designed to protect the. Why are we talking members. about the in police? The US, they were literally just slave catchers. Trying to reform them is like oh trying to repurpose a gun into a bandage. Fucking now, if Christ. that's the theme you took from Utena, that's a great foundation to inspire a story, and it can inspire any. Oh, if that's the theme you took from Utan, you mean the completely wrong one that wasn't even, like, what the show was saying at all because you're an idiot? Yeah. Also, the system Utana was talking about was patriarchy. Not, not, like, not, like, ruling class or police. It was, it was patriarchy. Yeah. Because Anthe was sacrificed by hundreds of swords of humanity's hatred so Akio could gain power. But she was trying to protect her innocent brother originally, but then Akio became a very corrupt adult. And yeah, I'm probably not explaining it the best. Just uh, go watch Utena. <laughs> Any story you could possibly imagine. But it seems like what Becky took from Utena was abused ballerina sword lesbian, which is keeping in line with how the fan. Utena is the one who wields the sword. Anthe is the abused one. So how are you saying that 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 Pearl having references to Utena herself with the way she swords fights is what <sighs> you make no sense. <laughs> Fandom tends to remember any given I should have been keeping count of how many times Kingdom Hearts was mentioned. Maybe if I edit this together as like a proper video, I'll put like in a little fucking Kingdom Hearts counter just for you, Jay. <laughs> Work. There's a lot in Steven Universe about revolutionizing the world, but in Utena, that was a red herring for the villains, and Steven Universe doesn't do anything with the idea- And who is the villains of Utena, uh, Lily? Because you haven't mentioned him. Because it's just the one. It's just Akio. It's just the end of the world. He's manipulating everybody. Have you even fucking seen Utena? <laughs> like, you didn't mention Akio once. He's pretty important to the fucking plot. <laughs> Other than Steven giving a magical feel-better speech. There's almost that theme in there with Steven- And again, when has Steven, like, actually solved things with speeches, like a shonen anime? Because that is what they do in shonen anime. I, I love how everyone, like, bitches about that. It's like, it's like, oh man, Steven Universe is so corny because there's friendship speeches and they go watch fucking, like- Boku no Hero Academia, or they go watch Demon Slayer or some shit where, like, the main character cries and gives friendship speeches all the time, because that's how fucking shonen anime works. But when Steven does it, it's somehow bad. <laughs> Even being really pacifist, but instead of talking about the use of systems created specifically for power and domination- I mean, Steven isn't even explicitly a pacifist. He will fight if he has to. He just, you know, tries to avoid doing that like most people would. Most people don't want to, like, you know, throw down immediately. They kind of want to talk talk it out, you know? <laughs> Being inherently harmful, it just goes, wah, violence, bad. Which, in terms of insightful and profound themes, is like waxing a car with a dog turd. To its credit, Utena never explicitly makes this theme. It just kind of sits there with it and expects you to get it, which is probably why we're in this mess. Utena doesn't have a violence, bad theme. It has a, it has a the lies we tell ourselves about how society works theme. It has a gender roles are bad theme. It has a throw away the entire system of patriarchy theme. It doesn't have a violence is bad theme. Oh, God. <laughs> it's filtering Utena through the lens of early adolescent nostalgia. So about half the themes are either being filtered out or interpreted in rather simple ways. If You don't, you don't even understand the themes of Utena and you don't even understand the themes of Steven Universe. This is such a mess. Get distance from a piece of art before revisiting it, you tend to keep your childhood interpretation of it. And looking at how that interpretation manifests, it seems like what Becky took from it was a lot of surface level visuals. I've spoken with other people who like this show, and the consensus. Because the references in Steam Universe are just surface level visual references, they were never meant to be taking on the same thing themes as Utena. Like I said, I have heard that that's kind of what the. The she show did, where they kind of just, like, replicated the ending of Utena without actually understanding it, which is pretty embarrassing. Also, there's a- there is a- we just saw the shot of, um, what I just said of, um, hang on. I spoke with- Utena, after being stabbed by Anthe, Anthe, uh, disappears. Because, like I said, the Anthe we see throughout the show is not her real body, it's a shell of her. Um, and that's always pretty clear. Um, Utena finds her coffin 
where she has been, where she has been trapped in this never-ending uh, cycle of suffering, and she forces it open and gets her out of there. Like, Akio is, like, going on and on about how, oh, the cycle is repeating itself, she's just gonna have to accept all the swords of humanity's hatred, oh well, I'll try again with another candidate. And Utain is all, all the while limping toward this coffin, and Akio's like, there's no point, you can't win, it's over, like, she's just gonna get stabbed repeatedly again, and like, whatever, just give up, and Utain is literally, like, grabs him by the face and shoves him aside and keeps going, and it's great. <laughs> So Utana, like, just basically, like, with her last breaths after being stabbed, gets gets the coffin open and meets the real Anthe. She even says to her, she calls her Himemia, which is her last name, but she says to her, Himemia, it's so good to finally meet you. So she is, she found the true Anthe and she's freeing her. That is the entire point of this scene. Like, Utana even understands this, that she never really knew Anthe until this moment. You know, that's why the scene is fucking important. She's the first one to make Anthe feel seen, literally. <laughs> so the people who like this show, and the consensus between us was that if Utena was a primary inspiration, Becky at most only half got it. But that's not a criticism. I'm not criticizing Becky. Or, CV Universe and Utena are two completely different shows with different themes and different levels of, like, um... Uh, subject matter, and um, it was just visual references to a show she likes, which is fine. I, I, what, what is wrong with that? <laughs> Here, it's just more of a neutral statement of fact. And as I came to that conclusion, I actually found a lot of value in Steven Universe, but maybe not in the way the creator intended. Let's see, how do I put this? So I'm a writer myself, both personally as I work on my own hobbies and professionally. Okay, we got it. We got it. We got to bring it again. We got to bring it back. <laughs> you know, I'm something of a writer myself. Mm hmm So far, I am unconvinced, because you don't even seem to fucking understand what metaphors are. <laughs> ...through this channel and ghostwriting on the side. I've been writing stories since- Oh, ghostwriting on the side. Yeah, good. What, what a- what a conveniently unprovable claim. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've written tons of books, just not under my name, and I can't really prove it, but I, t I totally, totally am a ghostwriter. Oh, my God. Are you ghostwriting fanfic for people or something? Like, like that just sounds like a lie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Since I was 14, and the main piece of original fiction I've been working on the last few years is called Scars, a story set in the 90s about two people who have been as close as they can possibly be since they were kids, contrasting their very different lived experiences. The primary theme, like with- So Lily is actually writing a coffee shop AU, but an original work, and it's probably going to be as exactly as boring as I said that concept sounded. Damn it, swag bucks, I ain't got time for you. <laughs> Most of my work is love, how love is the universal need, and how it's what keeps people going in bleak. Yeah, because you, you sound like a person full of love, Lily. You sound like a person who would really understand that as a, as a thematic concept, Lily. <laughs> I'm estranged from everyone in my family. I write stories about love. <laughs> I'm gonna die. <laughs> or even dreary circumstances. It's a very quiet story. It's, it's almost mundane. The thing is, when I talk about it, people ask me what my inspiration is, and they're very confused when I look them dead in the eye and say Kingdom Hearts. That throws people for a loop because they- Is this- Is this why- Is this why Kingdom Hearts has come up like 20 fucking goddamn times in this video when it's completely unrelated to anything you're talking about? So you could babble- about how your 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 original donut steel boring ass coffee shop webcomic is inspired by Kingdom Hearts. This video has barely been about Steven Universe. I'm gonna have to go back and like count like how much Steven Universe was actually in this fucking video. Jesus Christ. I at least hope you're all entertained by me like just just getting confused and shrill at this fucking thing. <laughs> no Kingdom Hearts is that anime game with Mickey Mouse in it where Donald kills a Power Ranger with a Dragon Ball laser. And if I were still 13, I'd have the same reaction. But as an adult replaying these games and seeing the series conclude its primary story, I didn't so much take the ballerina sword fighting or the... I'm something of a writer myself. I replayed Kingdom Hearts as an adult and realized it's brilliant, which 13-year-old me just couldn't appreciate. <laughs> uh. The 
big expansive anime plot from it. I took the story about the love Sora has for his friends and how it not only gives him strength, but protects him. How so, the usual shonen protagonist BS, which is exactly what Steven does. But it's okay when it's Sora. And Haley Joel Osment in like his fucking 30s still voicing him. <laughs> How many characters are built to be puppets of the main antagonist and go on this emotionally grueling journey to discover their own identities? How holding love close to your heart can keep you going even if you feel like you're complete- Is this why Lily likes Kingdom Hearts? Because it, it just reads like fan fiction? Like none of it makes any sense and they're always pulling bullshit right out of their asses all the time. Like who out here is saying that Kingdom Hearts has a- has a conclusive, satisfying story? <laughs> wasn't wasn't the, the after credit scene from three uh, Sora and Riku and fucking the world ends with you land? I'm pretty sure it was. This is just Kingdom Hearts is the most nonsensical goddamn bullshit. It, it, but you know, if you replay them as an adult, you could really appreciate the nuance in the writing. I guess. And I was already an adult when Kingdom Hearts was coming out. I think the first game came out in 2001. I was in my early 20s, so yeah. Um, they're not good as an adult either. <laughs> completely alone. These are themes that the creator always had on his mind, and playing these games as a child, a particularly lonely child at that, that really resonated with me even if I didn't realize it. <laughs> I wonder why you were a lonely child. I, est I estranged everybody in my family. <laughs> I wonder if you were a piece of shit even as a kid. It's only playing them as an adult I was consciously aware of them, and those concepts are universal. As I mentioned, there is this interesting theme in Utena about how oppressive systems cannot be weaponized for good. They are designed to resist you doing that. Utena was never going to save Anthe by being the one to own her instead of her brother. A gilded cage is- No, the point was, she was never going to save Anthe by being a prince because the whole prince-princess system is unequal in the first place. That was the point. <clears throat> it's still a cage. And while you can get that theme as an adult by, like, reading the works of Asada Shakur, you can also get it from Lord of the Rings. You cannot wield it. None of us can. What? The One Ring answers to Sauron alone. It has no other master. But taking a work on its most visceral emotional surface level... Is Lily saying the One Ring is like an oppressive social system? Like, the One Ring is just supposed to be fucking evil. If there's anything that has a very simplistic, unnuanced view of good and evil, it's fucking Lord of the Rings. It's just, like, purely evil is evil and good is good. That, like, it is that simple. It is that black and white, and it's fine, because that's the kind of story it is. It was supposed to be, like, old folklore. That was the entire point Tolkien had writing it. I, I don't get the connection between Akio, Akio dominating his sister and the fucking One Ring. I uh, let's just move on. <laughs> level isn't something exclusive to Becky. They're just the most elaborate about it. Fandoms are filled with people who simultaneously adore a given work of art and yet wildly miss the point of it. Look at how many fans of Fallout or Baldur's Gate see those games as just sandboxes. So much so that both franchises' third entries ended up being watered down, toothless versions of themselves. So you go from an entire game about resisting the pull of an evil Can god held Stay on a topic! Oh my jar, god! To a game where you are encouraged at all times to literally shove how long worms does this in your mouth. This is where nature versus nurture got us, apparently. Oh and I've been God. seeing this approach to it old works like a lot. More works like that borrow surface level features from something the creator the really here. liked, but lacking the narrative or thematic weight. And that's really the core issue of Steven Universe. It has a lot of big ideas, but its understanding of those ideas is through the lens of a nostalgic 13 year old. No! Your understanding of those ideas is through the lens of a 13 year old, because it's about your level of understanding of anything you've talked about today, Lily. Oh my god. Alright, I need to feed the animals. I'm a little late on that. I am definitely going to finish this video. Maybe next time I'll react to the movie video. Like I said, I kept pausing, so it was gonna, like, last for fucking- We're only 50 minutes into this fucking video! Jesus Christ! Alright, I'll be right back. Grasping at surface Oh wait, level. no! Ah! Alright, there we go. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I should've left some music on for you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> Just silence. Didn't H Bomber guy have like a video recently where he accused a bunch of people of plagiarism, but one of them was like internet historian and he already apologized for it and made good with the guy and it wasn't actually plagiarism, he was just reading an article and admitting to that. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, let's wrap this bitch up, huh? readings and not understanding why they work. The part where Anthe betrays Utena carries a lot of thematic weight to it. It's where Anthe has lost hope and chosen the devil she knows over the unknown that is increasingly looking bleak. It speaks to the way those in abuse- No, she's just that controlled by Akio that she can't believe that someone could become her prince and savior because that whole system is broken anyway and Anthe is kind of the one who tried to break it and was punished for it. So, you're leaving that part out. <laughs> use of situations will often refuse to leave because the unknown is frightening and they think they've already adapted to their own situation. Everyone develops ways to cope with abuse and the hardest part of recovering is when you don't need those strategies anymore. I coped with severe abuse as a child by learning oh, to bite Jesus first. Jesus Christ! Be such a problem, such a disturbance that it wasn't Stop worth it to Stop talking about your own this personal pro- we're skipping stepping this out into shit. The sun for the now we're talking time, about Kingdom Hearts again! I realized I never wanted to be alone again. I've come a long way since those days. I don't let a lot of people in, but I Lily ultimately Archer. cherish the ones I do let in. It's a much better place to be. Hello? So this moment resonates with this me in video is about all my Steven Universe. Utena, I think this Why are is you truly drama wonderful. Dumping? How does Steven Universe pay homage to what is arguably the biggest moment in the entire series? This wasn't an homage to that. Oh my fucking Christ. This wasn't an homage to that. This is just... Pearl being- she's- Pearl is sword fighting with one hand when this happens. It's not the same scene at all. Utena thinks she's protecting Anthe from Akio, but she doesn't know- She doesn't realize how much pull Akio has over Anthe, so Anthe- Anthe stabs her because that's what Akio wants her to do, because Utena refused to become his princess. Utena refused to become- to- give up being a prince and settle into heteronormativity with Akio. And so Akio has Anthe stab her, basically. That is basically what happens in that scene. This is just Pearl being careless and getting stabbed by her own tutorial bot, and it's funny. It's about waiting carefully for the perfect moment to cross. <gasps> the joke is she's talking about being careful, and she wasn't being careful, and so she got stabbed. It's not an homage to fucking Utena. Just because they homaged it earlier in this episode. Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, yeah, right? Like, Killer Squirtle, this whole time Lily has talked about Utena and its plot and its themes and its characters. Has not once mentioned Akio, the main fucking villain. Okay. Oopsie daisy. You know... Not to hit below the belt or anything, but if I had written a story like Utena, and this was how presumably- the Imagine writing a scene this sinister looking! The biggest fan of my work chose to pay homage to the single heaviest moment in the story where all the themes at play finally set- Look, I'm sorry, you're retarded. This is not an homage to Utena. Earlier it was- hang on. Pearl, sword fight, Utena. There's probably an image of it right fucking there. So earlier in the episode, like, these moves right here, that's from Utena, 100%. Um, it's, uh, it's just a visual. See, there we go. I told you, you see Utena do that fucking flip like a million goddamn times in, in the fucking show. You will see that flip. That is why I instantly recognized that flip when I saw it. So that's actually not, I think... Yeah, that one is. That's from the opening of Utena. That's what that's referencing. So yeah, these I all recognize as visual homages to Utena. But that doesn't mean that the scene where Pearl gets stabbed is an homage to that scene in Utena. There's like, there's like not even like anything resembling it other than she gets stabbed from behind. But the joke is she's talking about being careful and she's not being careful and then she gets stabbed. And this is how Steven finds out that gems can poof. This is how they introduce the concept and it's very comedic and I like it. Settle <laughs> in on the viewer. I would take that as the most damning indictment of my entire career. Look, I'm quite critical of Utena, but I can't think of anything harsher to say about it than some of its fans do when they pay homage to it. I've been pulling my punches on my critique of this show to avoid letting things get to a- Have you? Have you been pulling your punches? You're the one who, like, made a situation racist when it wasn't. 
like Christ. <laughs> Aggressive like the last one. But this this is fucking pathetic. Yeah, you're wrong. You're still wrong. You're still very wrong. You got more wrong as this video went on. Like, at first, I was, like, kind of fine. I was just giggling and poking a little fun here and there. And then you started saying some weird shit about about that one scene being being actually about a white woman assaulting a black woman somehow. And it's like, um, okay. I'm a little uncomfortable now. <laughs> If you just skip to this segment here, then hi, how are you? Having a good day? I think there's a fundamental difference between being wrong about something and your opinion and analysis changing over time. That's the f Your opinion and analysis didn't change one iota. What are you talking about? All you did was, like, manage to, like, spit out a few positive things about the show and then immediately, like, backhand it and, and, then, and then call Rebecca Sugar names again and then call the Diamonds Nazis again. And you haven't changed your mind on a single goddamn thing. None of the, then you just talked about Kingdom Hearts and and misunderstood Shoujo Kakume Atena for like half an hour. That's all this video was. <laughs> the folly of having one video become way more popular than all your other videos. Most people just won't see the newer. Yeah, sounds like somebody might be a little salty about that, huh? Hang on, the dog is barking. I have to go get her. Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear her, but yeah, she, uh... <laughs> she likes Over the bark. years, Steven Universe has become something of a critical muse. I talk about cartoons for a little... <laughs> hope she isn't as bad as marriage as she is <laughs> in her reviews. Wow. Oh, uh, that might be more cutting than anything I've said tonight. <laughs> it's not a glamorous job, but then neither is yours. And one problem I've had over the last few years is that- Excuse you, my job is very uh, glamorous. Uh, I get kissed by puppies on the weekends, and during the week, I draw booba for cougar. It's good to I have a good life. <laughs> shows that are interesting to talk about and shows that actually pull in the views don't really overlap. If you want to pay your rent, you have to talk about the latest story-driven adventure fantasy show, and they're all so same- Or- Lily, you could go down to the local Home Depot or something to get a fucking job. I don't know why you keep talking about the latest fantasy adventure show when earlier in this video you admitted you don't even like the genre. So, why is your opinion valuable here? <laughs> like I said earlier, I'm not interested in sports movies, so I don't, like, watch them and make reviews on them. No one would want my opinion on the latest, like, baseball epic or something because I'd be fucking bored by it and I wouldn't understand it. So, you know, kind of exactly like Lily Orchard talking about cartoons. Tiny <laughs> and boring that there's just nothing really to talk about. Steven Universe, at least, has a lot of things to unpack. It's fascinating to do that. I could sit here and look at episodes that work and compare and contrast them to episodes that don't for- Please! Please do, because it would be very funny. <laughs> Probably infuriating, but also very funny. Hours upon hours upon hours if I wanted to. And I do want to. But I mean, Hip is Hip is making videos on Steam Universe now that are getting more hits than yours, so. And we all know you only made this because Hip made his video about you, so. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. If I wanted to, but I don't want to because reasons, because Rebecca Sugar, she ran over my dog. <laughs> but I understand when a video has gotten too long. I still think the show is pretty bad. You understand when a video has gotten too long? Like, you could have cut out half the shit you were talking about Kingdom Hearts and your own therapy and your life and misunderstanding Utena. If you cut all that shit out, this, this fucking video would be half an hour long. <laughs> But it's bad in fascinating ways that I could spend so much time going through. But I am going to take this segment to talk about things from the old video that I would gouge out with a rusty spoon if I could. Really? Well, this should be interesting. Is there anything you regret saying in that video, Lily? I wonder. Clearly it isn't that the diamonds are Nazis. Clearly it isn't anti-Semitism because you just made that fucking comment about the crystal gems being branded with a star. <laughs> Shark, I don't know if you were here for that one. But Lily Orchard, in pointing out that the diamonds are Nazi fascists, said that the crystal gems are branded with a star. 
<laughs> like it was a point. Yeah, yeah, um, I'll, I'll clip that part for you uh, later. <laughs> For one, the tone. The video is very aggressive and personal, and some get the indication I think she- I am for- I am for real. I know that sounds like something I would make up to fuck with you. I- I, I appreciate that, <laughs> but it actually happened. <laughs> or killed my family or something. Uh, funnily enough, uh, people blame this on, like, some kind of Machiavellian agenda. This actually wasn't unique to this video. Most of the videos- No, you just think the show has a Machiavellian agenda of some variety somehow, and you think it's- paying homage to Utena when it's not, and, uh, oh, happy Hanukkah. I used to know when all the Jewish holidays were when I was at my print job, because I did a lot of the print work for the synagogue, but <laughs> I, I had one lady trying desperately to get me to pronounce Hebrew words right, and I just cannot make my mouth move that way. It's like German, I just, I can't. <laughs> German or Russian, I cannot make my mouth do those things. <laughs> I made in 2017 and 2018 were quite angry. This is just the only one most of you have seen. Uh, I was being severely abused by my partner. All of your fucking videos sound angry and also, well, my, <coughs> my video is only so angry because I was being abused. I was being abused, so that's why I called I called Rebecca Sugar a gasoline huffing piece of shit Nazi sympathizer because my abuse. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like, fuck off. <laughs> Honest to God. Partner at the time, and it made me an unpleasant person to be around. Oh, partner at the time. Is this the ex that everyone says Lily abused? Because, I mean, I'm not gonna, like, outright say Darvo, but you sound like the kind of person who would Darvo. Um, I'm, j I'm just saying. <laughs> no excuse for that. I wasn't in a good place mentally, and I'm in a better place mentally now, and I'm with some- Are you? Are you? Are you? I guess you're married now, so I guess I will have to trust that this is um, a healthy relationship. I mean, considering the way you are, um, maybe you're different off screen. Maybe this is just an internet personality, but um, from things that I've heard, it doesn't seem so. <laughs> Someone else who makes me very happy. Well, I don't think Sugar is a talented creator. I would apologize for the sheer barrage of personal attack. Imagine calling Rebecca Sugar untalented. She wrote... All of the songs for the Steven Universe movie in like six weeks, because that's all the time she had. And after I heard that, I became pretty convinced she's probably a musical genius, <laughs> honestly. And she does all her demos on a fucking ukulele, Jesus Christ. <laughs> How hardcore is that? Tax if I could. I was. <laughs> yeah, she's a ukulele bard. You want Ben Shabibo to end up writing a movie with Lily Orchard? It would just be the it would just be the two of them talking like this back and forth to, at each other, and having a debate. I'm a debate. Debate me, bro. You know, I'm the smarter one. I'm the rational one because I talk like this. You know? <laughs> it would just be it would just be a wall of that. <laughs> this, this, this noise, just just nasally staccato speaking to try to sound smart. Ugh. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it's taking out my anger at many other things onto this project that I've been working on for a while. So you admit that you unfairly hate Steven Universe, and yet you're still, like, just making all of the same complaints. You haven't actually told us what you recant yet, so, um, let's, uh, let's see. <laughs> While, and like I said, every video was like this. I was just taking out my anger on everything else, and that- I mean, all of your videos are exactly like that from what I've heard, so I think you were just angry all of the time. Maybe, maybe you don't need a therapist, maybe you need fucking anger management courses- <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, weaponized therapy language is right. Was obscenely wrong of me. Not gonna sugarcoat it, obscenely wrong. Uh, for two, Stevani. I was way too harsh on Stevani. At the time, Steven Universe was the only place you could get NB rep in animation, and the fact that it sucked certainly didn't help, but since then- Why does it suck, though? Isn't, like, the whole point of Stevani? As far as I know. Like... Oh, it was the one of the earliest thing- representations of this, but- because it was early, it wasn't as 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 uh, complex as I wanted it to be. Therefore, it sucks. Like, it's really your only c complaint. <laughs> then we've actually had non-binary rep get better and worse at the same time. So Steven Universe is just in this weird middle ground. Compared to Double Trouble, Stevani is practically merciful. I think Steg probably really uh, tempered my opinion on Stevani. It, it's kind of clear that the imagination for other fusion designs just wasn't really there for any of Steven's fusions with other humans. They both look like they came right out of Becky's spank bank, honestly. Smoky Quartz and Rainbow- What? Because he's muscular? 
because Steg looks like the ultimate rock star, which is what Steven and Greg would imagine together. Like, how do you how do you not understand that Steg is just supposed to be like an ultimate badass, like '80s rock star? Because that's what Steven and Greg have in common. Oh, God. <laughs> Both courts were just a lot better, uh, but my criticisms of them crossed the line into outright MB phobia at times, and I apologize for that. In general, non binary characters are characters I've always found very interesting. The sheer breadth of experiences and okay, presentations and identities is very again. creative, and it always bothered me that for a long time, designers either went full non human. Are you gonna apologize about the human zoo thing? That's, that's what I thought was the worst take in the original two hour video. <laughs> or stayed strictly femme. I said it poorly in the last video, but non-binary oh characters God, are an unexplored just a bunch of buzzwords of character design, and so few people really run with it. I'm so happy we eventually got Rain Whispers. Uh, this is something Steven Universe actually okay. themselves improved okay. upon later with Shep, who isn't in the show very much, but in terms of characterization and design, is great. One major problem with non-binary okay. characters is... <laughs> Sorry. Did I say major problem with non-binary I meant one major problem with how people write non-binary characters is a lot of people on the internet view non-binary as just woman light. And so there's far more femme-leaning and femme-presenting non-binary characters. Okay, you're going on another really long tangent that has nothing and to that's do with anything. Bother at all because the non-binary shapeshifter is becoming far too commonplace. For all my criticisms of the Owl House. Can we talk about I Steven Universe again? very well-written non-binary characters who each have different- I think it was that Shep has a good design was- was the point. Um. <laughs> Shep being Poochie will never not be funny. Actually, no, when- when- when Future was- was still airing, and we heard that- that- that, um, Sadie was going to be with someone named Shep of- of ambiguous gender, a bunch of us were joking that it was Commander Shepard. Like, uh, Sadie traded up for a better space commander. <laughs> so it's only saying Shep couldn't be Commander Shepard. Hmm. <clears throat> anyway. Gender presentation? She and <laughs> kept hearing Shep. Yeah, she's dating Shep. From the Three Stooges. <laughs> Either of them is the shapeshifter. For three, the entire racism segment. I've said this in about 17 different places before. I think the racism in Steven Universe warrants full analysis, and I've been- I mean, the racism you fucking made up that- that- you know, in this- and you, you still said it in this fucking video! You're like, oh, Pearl tricking Garnet into fusing is a white woman assaulting a black woman, and also Sugalite's existence is racist for reasons because she's kind of ugly because you know fusions tend to look weirder the more gems are involved and sugalite would be a three gem fusion technically because garnet is ruby and sapphire so the more gems you have in a fusion the more bizarre they start to look we see that with alexandrite too who has a mouth under her mask face that also has a working mouth i mean that's four gems and then you have, like, fucking, you have fucking, uh, the, the, who's it, Inkle? Florate. You have Florate, who's six gems, and she's basically a giant caterpillar. <laughs> you know, they tend to get more weird looking the more gems are involved. That's just kind of how it works. But I guess the character is racist because nose, because sharp teeth, because, I don't know, she's just kind of ugly. I mean, I think most of the fusions are ugly personally, <laughs> but that's just me. I am very, I'm very bad when I design fusions. I, I like, don't take any risks at all. I'm terrible. I've been working on a script doing just that for a while. It's generally something I tinker with in between. Oh, you're working on a script about the racism in Steven Universe. By all means, please elaborate on this topic and show us how it's not just you being racist and imposing that on the show. I would love to see that video, Lily. <laughs> projects, But the language I used for that segment was beyond inappropriate, mostly taking it from an article I sourced. Some of the words coming out of- An article you sourced? And it's the article's fault you said those words? So you mean you were just, like, plagiarizing, you were just reading an article and not actually giving your own opinion? Probably because you didn't actually even watch the full show, I bet. Yeah, is that, is that it? 
Or you just, like, saying, you saw people, like, making the reach that Sugalite is somehow racist and then just went with it because it was, like, the popular hate opinion at the time? Because you're a fucking sheep? Is that is that it, Lily? Uh, is that- I'm getting oddly aggressive right now. <laughs> probably because- probably because Bismuth is on the- on the screen looking, like, completely over everything at the moment. <laughs> I feel you, Bismuth. I feel you. I'm right there. <laughs> my mouth in there were flat out disgusting, and they weren't mine to use. No excuse for that. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, that new script I fully intend to pass by a sensitivity reader when it's done, because in 2023 I just don't trust myself with anything anymore. For far. Is that a joke? Are you really having uh, a sensitivity comment, reader? I, if you had a fucking sensitivity reader, your racism segment in this video would never have happened. I assure you. Never actually called uh, Sugar a Nazi. Uh, what I did was question whether the show's fixation on redeeming space Nazis from the moon was malice or stupidity, and- No, what you said was, I'm not saying Rebecca Sugar's a Nazi, but if anyone were to think she's a Nazi because of the way the show ends, then they'd be totally right, but I'm not saying it. Uh-huh. That is just you saying it and just giving yourself a little bitty buffer to try to pretend you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. I've always concluded that it's stupidity. I concluded that in the video itself, but I think I did hang on that issue far too long. I actually rewrote that entire section two years ago, and I Oh, think dear God, is that another thing I'm gonna have to watch? Maybe we're just gonna, like, in the next few streams, we're just gonna <laughs> react to Lily Orkin. <laughs> While I fail to actually, like, get a lot of drawing done. That'd it's just great. way better. It talks about how the show's ink, commitment though, to redemption yeah. at any cost ends up being very unintentionally cruel to abuse survivors. Look, I'm an abuse survivor myself, and one thing I will never be on board with. Press X to doubt. I'm sorry, but like, you're going- you, 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 This entire video, you just be like, Well, I was abused, that's why my old video was bad, and I've had trauma, and I, I go to therapy, and I called my therapist, and I- You know, like, you know, A, nobody cares. You're supposed to be making a video about a show, not you. And B, you know, if you have to say it that much, it it kind of makes me wonder. And also things I've heard. So, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a just say. Yeah, I don't exactly entirely believe that. <laughs> Is some dickhead telling me I need to forgive for my own sake. I've been abused quite severely uh, throughout my life and uh, by a lot of people. And I've made peace with some of them and I haven't made peace with others. Let me guess, every single one of your exes is crazy, and it wasn't you. They're just nuts and abusers, right? <laughs> and one, I would dig my memories of them out of my head with a rusty screwdriver and forget they ever existed if I could. And nowhere in that path of recovery did anyone insisting I needed to forgive ever do anything but piss me off. A lot of abuse survivors are ga- Oh, jeez, sounds like maybe you're a petty grudge holder, and that's why you hate stories where people actually reconcile and forgive each other. You know, I hate this fucking trend of, like, forg now forgiveness can never, ever, ever happen in anything because forgiving people who did one bad thing is wrong because doing one bad thing means you're evil forever and everybody else acts perfectly all of the time until they don't and then they're just torn apart by a mob and then they move on to the next person to destroy and that's that's twitter basically <laughs> gaslit into believing that being angry will make them a monster and you will never convince me that this is a good thing to teach people especially children i will always be firmly against who says being where in the show does it indicate that being angry makes you a monster like, Steven has plenty of righteous anger when no one will tell him about Pink Diamond and he decides to go off and see the palanquin by himself. Like, he is fucking pissed. Like, he's pissed off in a little kid way, but he's pissed. And so that very concept, especially in children's animation. Four fives. I would delete- You know, maybe you should just- You know, Lily, I have, so, I have a word of advice for you, Lily. Maybe you watch something not for children for once. Alright, maybe play some video games also not for children for once. You seem to consume nothing but children's entertainment. And maybe beyond that, maybe just like popular family-friendly things. Like, if you want stuff with all these complex dark themes, like go fucking watch something for adults. <laughs> Stop expecting it from children's programming. Delete the entire animation segment. Even when that video went up, I wasn't entirely on board with it. I know behind the scenes a lot of pre-production work just wasn't done, and the animators were working overtime, also writing the Where are you getting this from? Where are you getting this from other than your ass? 
from your claims in your original two-hour video where you said, like, nobody has, like, design sheets or anything when they all- they absolutely do and we've seen them? And you, you didn't understand how network television operates and you don't know how long it takes for an animated episode to be made? <laughs> Very evidently. Um... Yeah, tales- tales from your ass. I have never heard about the animators being overworked on Steven Universe, unless you're just talking about Korean animation studios in general and how they are, which, yeah, I mean, Japan too, but that's, like, like, isn't this supposed to be about, like, saying you were wrong about things? And here you're just, like, doubling down on a bunch of your original points. This is supposed to be you saying you were wrong about something, Lily. I think you're allergic to that. ...story, and the only reason projects do that is because writers are unionized and animators aren't. So when your storyboarders are writing the episodes, you can pay them less. All the excuses about visual storytelling? Complete horse. It's just a board-driven show. Those exist. That's how Hao Miyazaki writes all his movies. Through storyboards. It's, it's definitely a viable technique. The storyboard artists are still the writers, and they still, like, have, like, episode outlines and shit, you know? You just don't understand how anything works in production. <laughs> or shit. Shows with scripts and writers do visual storytelling all the time, and Steven Universe's claim to visual storytelling is pretty weak. And honestly, that deserved to have- Incorrect. Steven Universe is some of the best visual storytelling. You just- you just can't follow it because you're- I don't know. I guess all the abuse. <laughs> way more focused than the fact that the characters aren't on model because that shit's a symptom and a symptom nobody would care about if the writing was better. I only included it in the first place because it was a really- You want to talk about on model when I've seen your wife's artwork? <laughs> I, t I said I wasn't going to be mean about the art again. <laughs> a big point of contention for SU Crit at the time and I felt like I had to include it for completeness' sake. But in truth it was- Did you just unironically call yourself part of SU Crit? Oh my god, die. <laughs> you should die of humiliation right now. How are you not embarrassed to say that? <laughs> Big point of contention precisely because it was easy to see. The more in-depth and nuanced criticism was a lot harder and would get you harassed for five years. Nuanced and in-depth criticism? Is that what you think you did? <laughs> Is that what you think you did? <laughs> really? Everyone's been telling you year for years and years that you're just, you're just fucking stupid and you didn't understand the show and you can't follow a children's show and you went into it, you went into it wanting to hate it, and you just admitted that you were so angry in the video because you were angry at unrelated things in your life. So, like, <laughs> what are you talking about? For sixes, this is less of a retraction and more of an expansion, but I really- well, Less of a retraction and more of an expansion. So, you know, you're not even gonna say that you were wrong about anything, huh? You're just gonna expand on how you were right, actually. For reasons. <laughs> he got on Becky's case for the puberty subject, just being carte blanche to perv on Stevani. The truth is, a lot of teenage girls do get hypersexualized. Okay, look, I think the Stevani episode, the first Stevani episode, is also a little weird, and I, I, I don't think they quite achieved what they were going for, if that's what they were going for, because it just really s seems like everyone just instantly finds Stevani hot, and that's a little strange. And, like, People try to tell me it's about how, like, oh, when you start developing and you start getting looked at by people sexually and, you know, how that affects you, but Stevani doesn't notice any of it. <laughs> we just see people ogling them, and, like, that seems to be the point. It's like, ooh, look at how hot this person is. So, this gender, look how hot this gender ambiguous person is. That's kind of what it comes across as. So, I'm just kind of like, eh, I don't know. I don't know exactly what the hell you were going for here, but I don't think it's it. <laughs> I don't have a problem with Savani otherwise, well, that first episode is a little weird. But I, I don't think it's it's quite as bad as Lily is trying to make it out to be. ...once they hit puberty, but that's not really a puberty thing, so much as it is a men being pervs thing. The thing that but it is a puberty thing, Lily! Take it from me, I developed breasts when I was like 10. That really bothered me was Becky's statement about how hitting puberty gives you the body of an adult and how it gives you power, and to put that kind of thing onto puberty and suggest that is kind of missing the forest for the trees. Being objectified doesn't give you power. I it's don't think that was the point either, though. I just, I think the episode was just kind of poorly executed. <laughs> <laughs> exact opposite of that. Then again, the quote I was taking from is highly likely to have been misspoken. Becky misspeaks more than I do, and I've actually said the phrase her pr Um, look, I don't think Rebecca misspeaks. I think you just, like, 
give the most uncharitable, tr- like, interpretation you possibly can of her words because you just hate her for no clear reason. Because, I don't know, she put your pet turtle under a bucket when you were kids and killed it? I, <laughs> what did she do to you? <laughs> Pronouns are they, them, multiple times in the past. My speech is fucked. I'm not an eloquent lady, and so I- Me, 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 I, 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 we're talking about you again. What were you wrong about the show in, Lily? Look at this free stream of Jasper, actually. Very appropriate for what I'm drawing right now. <laughs> I'm inclined to just ignore that issue today. Like, on reflection, this is small potato stuff in comparison to, like, the big picture issues. But it does raise my point about how Stevani is supposed to be non-binary, but the expression of the trials and tribulations of puberty are being oh done- Oh god, you've already talked about this! That's only half of their components. The conclusion drawn there is that if you want to do a puberty episode, then just do a puberty episode. Don't do a fusion episode. Granted, this is something that improved leaps and bounds as the show went on, especially- It was a fusion episode about fusion, they just contrasted it with puberty, and again, not very successfully in my mind, but- <laughs> Only in the one episode where Stevani has facial hair, uh, which is a design element most people just wouldn't do. On reflection, with the show being done, it's clear the writers give a shit about non-binary rep. They might have sucked at it for a while, but sucking at something isn't a problem. S sucking at something can be fixed with patience. And I still maintain that Shep is fucking amazing. If we had to stumble through a minefield to get Shep, then fucking cheers. I'll drink to that, it's more visible effort than- it, do you like Shep just because Shep is non-binary? I mean, the character is just kind of there to be non-binary. Isn't that, like, the kind of bad rep you would talk about in the past? Because, I mean, I kind of get what they were going for, where it's like, maybe Steven needs, like, an outside perspective to really see what he's doing, but, like, it is just a little out of nowhere, like... Hey, man, I've only only met you today, and we've only hung out for, like, half an hour, but I, I think you might have some problems, man. <laughs> you know, it's like, that doesn't really happen in real life. It'd be a little awkward. <laughs> it's like, unless it was just so obvious that Steven is, like, just, like, ready to snap. Shep is like, oh, boy, you know, have you guys, like, checked on your friend recently? <laughs> I think he looks, he looks like he's about to explode. <laughs> I don't- I don't want Shep, like, just not even reacting to the- to the magic powers, because humans in Steven Universe don't seem to. They just seem very, very oblivious and just very kind of like, eh, shrug their shoulders at things, <laughs> which I always found very funny. <laughs> She-Ra had. See, this is what I'm talking about. The leaps and bounds between when Steven Universe is fucking brilliant and when it smashes its face- <laughs> Shep probably heard stories from Sadie! Oh, you're right! Sadie was probably like, okay, listen, we're gonna- we're gonna go visit my friends, and I need you to know- that um, a bunch of them are magical aliens, and they have a boy child with superpowers. Are you okay with that? And Shep was like, "Okay, sure. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll just uh, assess this when I see it." <laughs> <laughs> the mountain is so interesting to break down. That's what happens when you wear your inspirations on your sleeve. Th that's what happens when something can be practically unpacked forever. When you wear your inspirations on your sleeve, says someone who called their Star Wars OC their baby. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh wanted to. I have wanted to do other videos on Steven Universe, and I've always restrained myself, because there's this narrative that all I do is talk about it for hours, but, like, I do want to talk about it for hours. I you, like, you talked about fucking Kingdom Hearts in this more than you did Steven Universe, I think. <laughs> I want to go over it with a fine tooth comb like a fucking archaeologist. Well, please do. Please do, because you never seem to understand it, and maybe, like, hey, taking an actual closer look and actually studying the themes of the show and, like, rewatching the whole thing, maybe you would actually have some good fucking takes for once, but I have a feeling you're set in your ways. Technologist! So fuck it, might as well put it out there. I do a podcast occasionally with my wife and whoever wants to talk about a given subject. I am not listening to your podcast. And there's that weird little thing again. Yeah, I'm not gonna listen to your podcast to hear even more bad takes. <laughs> Check. Usually just one of my friends. Someone who loves this show and thinks- Again, isn't this supposed to be about where you were wrong? Thinks it's brilliant writing and has interesting arguments as to why, and who is 19 years of age or older. I'm offering to let you come on and do a podcast with me. Let me be clear- Should I go on Lily Orchid's podcast? <laughs> Now that I would have to be drunk for. <laughs> this is not a debate, and it is not an argument. It's not so you can complain about fake Nazi accusations. I'm inviting you to come- Fake Nazi accusations that you absolutely fucking made. 
No, 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 we can't talk about where I was wrong. You have to defend this show to me. <laughs> Nerd the fuck out. Come info dump to me. I've never heard a coherent argument for why this show is good, and I want to hear it. My What? But half, like, you, you open this video talking about things you thought were good in the show. Ugh. I don't know if I could stand listening to Lily Orchid that long. It might also get awkward, because I'm pretty, like... Yeah, I would probably just get muted immediately, like, the second I just said you're a fucking retard. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said the no-no word! This, this podcast is over! Work emails in the description. Give me one short paragraph of analysis to show me you have something interesting- I'm not writing an essay to get on your show, Lily. Fuck off. Talk about. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for watching my tirade, and- um, this whole section was supposed to be about why you're wrong, and all you did was double down on your points and never admitted to anything wrong, except you said your earlier racism argument was wrong, but then you made an even worse racism argument in this video. <laughs> oh, let me let me go back and find the part talking about- because this is basically over. Fuck- I'm not watching to the end. Fuck you. You already got my YouTube premium money. Um- let me find the part talking about the the crystal gems being branded with stars because we were all losing our fucking shit. What the hell was that? When was that in there? Was that from Big Bang Theory? I don't know. I'm referencing all these fucking random shows too. Talking about Korra. Talking about. I'm trying to remember where that where it was. Um, that was your your super fancy fucking OC. Your baby. That's the Star Wars OC. Yeah, because that was, like, probably the worst take in this whole fucking episode, and it bears repeating. Um, was it, like, later on after all this? It feels like it was ages ago, but, like, let's talk about the diamonds. Um, there it is! Look at that! I, I got right, I got right on the screenshot of it. I am, I am the best. Lily Orchid is a Big Bang Theory defender? Okay. That's, that's the worst thing about Lily Orchid right there. I'm saying it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, yeah, Sharkman. Sharkman, you still there? You, got, you gotta hear this shit, man. <laughs> you gotta hear this shit. It's unbelievable. I, like, it, like, it, like, glossed right over, like, it glossed right over my brain the first time I heard it, and I had to go back, like, wait, what did you just say? What the fuck did you just say? Here we go. An episode later, it's like, oh, these fucking guys again. He was so invested in this reconciliation, and then he just gave up, seemingly off screen. Well, we know why. The Diamond's Redemption was the single most contentious thing the show ever did. You spend the entire show being told, yep, they're evil, they're oppressive, they do genocide, they hate non-standard relationships, they don't respect people's identities, all the people they want to exterminate are branded with stars, and then- All the people they want to exterminate are branded with stars, that means something, I am- I am making a very, a very specific implication here. Yeah, with the echo effect, like, it's a big revelation. Um, not every gem the diamonds killed was a crystal gem. Only crystal gems were a star to mark themselves as being rebels. Um... This is even worse than when people saw that the Eldians wear armbands in Attack on Titan and said it was somehow anti-Semitic, when it was clearly just visual shorthand for these are an oppressed people. Um, <laughs> and that isn't even what the stars in Steam Universe mean. I pointed out earlier that A, Sugar has stated they picked a star because it's a fairly gender-neutral symbol that both girls and boys would want to wear. And B... If you look at the star on Rose Quartz's outfit, it kind of looks like a hibiscus. And a hibiscus is what? It's the symbol of pink diamond. <laughs> derp de derp de do. No, Killer Squirtle, there is no goddamn evidence that Attack on Titan has fascist leanings like people say. In fact, it, it kind of shows how horrendous military stuff is. And... Like, the entire point of the ending of Attack on Titan is humans are violent and there will always be a cycle of violence as long as we exist because 
that's the world. I mean, you might not like that ending, but it is pretty realistic. <clears throat> I just hate that people saw, like, Eldians have armbands and went, oh, The Eldians are supposed to be Jews! And he's saying Jews are monsters! And it's like, you're fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know all of Attack on Titan up to the ending. I actually I haven't actually read the manga, but I know how the manga ends, and I am going to finish the anime. I gave up in season two just because they changed directors, and it was kind of weird because it was like they were trying to direct it in the way they thought the previous director would direct it. It was just kind of off and, and odd, and, and I don't know. It was just kind of like, ick. But then the story kind of got more interesting when, uh, when Eren became, like, a fucking psychopath, so, you know. <laughs> It's good shit. Good shit. Anyone who thinks Attack on Titan is glorifying genocide wasn't fucking paying attention. <laughs> anyway. I had been thinking of watching the video on the Steven Universe movie, but it's almost 6 o'clock now. So, shut up. Um, but apparently Lily Orkady... Lily Orka... Orka Smorka here has, um... Has a video on the Steven Universe movie. Which I didn't know about. It's probably bad, but it's only 26 minutes long. Maybe this one actually stays on topic and doesn't talk about Lily's therapy appointments and Kingdom Hearts. <laughs>